All right. <clears throat> Varcaralis, chapter 15, Schizophrenia. <coughs> Key terms and concepts. Acute dystonia, affect, or affect, affective symptoms, akathisia, kathasia, uh, ambivalence, anosognosia, anosognosia, associative looseness, atypical antipsychotics, autism, clang association, cognitive systems, command hallucinations, concrete thinking, conventional antipsychotics, delusions, depersonalization, derealization, echolalia, echopraxia, extrapyramidal side effects, EPSs, hallucinations, ideas of reference, illusions, metabolic syndrome, negative symptoms, neologisms, neuroleptic malignant syndrome, NMS, paranoia, par paranoia positive symptoms, Pseudo Parkinsonism, pseudo Parkinsonism, Parkinsonism, reality testing, recovery model, stereotyped behaviors, tardive dyskinesia or TD or TDK, word salad. Schizophrenia is a potentially devastating brain disorder that affects a person's thinking, language, emotions, social behavior and ability to perceive reality accurately. It affects one in every 100 people, over 3 million people in the United States, and is among the most disruptive and disabling of mental disorders. Unfortunately, people with this disorder are often misunderstood and stigmatized by not only the general population, but even the medical community. Negative attitudes toward patients can interfere with recovery and impair their quality of life. For example, many believe that people with schizophrenia are likely to be violent, but the rate of violence for schizophrenia overall is no greater than that of the general public. Schizophrenia is a psychotic disorder, meaning that delusions, hallucinations, and disorganized thinking, speech, and or behavior are prominent elements of, this, this, of the disorder. Clinical Picture Adding to observations made by Emil Kraepelin, 1856 to 1922, <clears throat> Eugene Bluer, Bluler, 1857 to 1939, uh, coined the term schizophrenia. He proposed that schizophrenia was not an illness but a heter heterogeneous group of illnesses with different characteristics and clinical courses. Bluler's fundamental signs of schizophrenia are referred to as the four A's, affect, the outward manifestation of a person's feelings and emotions. Schizophrenia may cause flat, blunted, inappropriate, or bizarre affect. Associative looseness. Disorganized thinking manifested as jumbled and illogical speech and impaired reasoning is displayed also, uh, is displayed also known as looseness of association. Autism. Thinking is not bound to reality but reflects the private perceptual world of the individual delusions hallucinations and neologisms um, or made up words are examples of autistic thinking ambivalence simultaneously holding two opposing emotions attitudes ideas or wishes toward the same person situation or object ambivalence occurs in all relationships but becomes pathological and paralyzing when a person continuously uh, vacillates uh, between opposing positions. Vignette. Sam, a 25-year-old man, soon to be discharged from the hospital, constantly tells the social worker he wants his own apartment. When Sam is told that an apartment has been found for him, he asks, but who will take care of me? Sam is acting out his ambivalence between his desire to be independent and his desire to be taken care of. Figure 15.1, Diagnostic Criteria for Schizophrenia. Uh, characteristic symptoms, this is out of the DSM, characteristic symptoms, two or more of the following during a one-month period or less if successfully treated. One, delusions. Two, hallucinations. Three, disorganized speech, e.g. associative looseness. 
4. Grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior. 5. Negative symptoms, e.g. Eff effective flattening, uh, avolition, or elogia. Um, if delusions if delusions, bizarre auditory hallucinations, and A. Voices keep running co commentary about person's thoughts and behaviors, or B. Two or more voices converse with each other. Then only one criterion is needed. B. Uh, social occupational dysfunction. If one or more major areas of the person's life are markedly below pre-morbid functioning, uh, work, interpersonal relationships, or self-care, or if childhood or adolescence failure uh, to achieve an expected level of interpersonal, academic, or occupational achievement, then meets criteria of B. C. Duration. Continuous signs persist for at least six months with at least one month that meets criteria of A. Active phase and may include prodromal or residual symptoms. D. 1. All other mental diseases, e.g. Schizo schizoaffective mood disorder, have been ruled out. 2. All other medical conditions, substance abuse, medications, or general medical conditions have been ruled out. Or 3. If history of pervasive development disorders, then prominent hallucinations or delusions for one month are needed to make the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Clinicians in the United States use the criteria for the, of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 4th edition, text revision for the diagnosis of schizophrenia. Figure 15.1 pre sense, presents the uh, DSM criteria for schizophrenia. Other psychotic disorders, e.g. schizophreniform and schizoaffective disorders, are described in box, box 15.1. <coughs> Excuse me. Box 15.1, Psychotic Disorders Other Than Schizophrenia. Schizophreniform Disorder. The features of schizophreniform disorder are similar to schizophrenia except the total duration of the illness is at least one month but less than six months. Impaired social or occupational functioning may not be apparent, although it may appear later. This disorder or may or may not develop into schizophrenia. Persons who do not develop schizophrenia have a good prognosis this diagnosis may be given when a person appears to have schizophrenia but has not even yet been symptomatic for the six months required by DSM criteria. Brief Psychotic Disorder This disorder involves a sudden onset of psychosis, delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, or grossly disorganized or catatonic behavior lasting at least one day but less than one month. It is often precipitated by extreme stressors and is followed by a return to pre-morbid functioning. Schizoaffective disorder. Schizoaffective disorder is characterized by a major depressive, manic, or mixed mood episode presenting concurrently with symptoms of schizophrenia. The symptoms are not due to any substance use or to a medical condition. Delusional disorder. Delusional disorder involves non-bizarre delusions, e.g. situations that could occur in real life, such as being followed, deceived by a spouse, or having a disease, of at least one month's duration. One's ability to function is not markedly impaired, nor is behavior uh, otherwise odd or psychotic. Common themes include delusions of control, reference, persecution, grandeur, somatic er erotomania, or... Uh, jealousy. A related disorder, Capgras syndrome, um, or Capgras syndrome, involves a delusion about a significant other, uh, like a family member or a pet, being replaced by an imposter. This disorder may be due to psychiatric or organic brain disease. Shared psychotic disorder, folie à deux. Folie à deux, shared psychotic disorder. Folie à deux, madness between two, is a condition in which one individual comes to share the delusional beliefs of, of another with whom there is a close, sustained relationship. Impairment is usually, is usually much less than that of the person who has the psychotic disorder. 
For example, a man living with a wife and daughter who both had schizophrenia came to share their belief that standing too close to the stove while cooking caused obesity. Hmm. Induced or secondary psychosis. Psychosis may be induced by substances, drugs, of abuse, alcohol, medications, or toxins, or caused by a medical condition, delirium, neurological, or metabolic conditions, hepatic or renal diseases, and many others. Medical conditions and substance abuse must always be ruled out before a diagnosis of schizophrenia or other psychotic disorder can be made. Epididi, epidemi, epidem, epidemiology, epidemiology. The lifetime prevalence of schizophrenia is 1% worldwide with no differences related to race, social status, or culture. It is more common in males, uh, 1 to 4... 1.4 to 1 ratio, and among persons growing up in urban areas. Schizophrenia usually develops during the late teens and early 20s, although onset before the age of 10 has been reported. Childhood schizophrenia, although rare, does, does exist, occurring in 1 out of 40,000 children. Early onset, 18 to 25 years, occurs more often in males and is associated with poor functioning before onset, more structural brain abnormal, 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 abnormality, and uh, increased levels of apathy. Individuals with a later onset, 25 to 35 years, are more likely to be female, have less structural brain abnormality, and have better outcomes. Comorbidity. Substance abuse disorders occur in nearly 50% of persons with schizophrenia. When substance abuse occurs in people with schizophrenia, it is associated with treatment non-adherence, relapse, incarceration, homelessness, violence, suicide, and a poor prognosis. Nicotine dependence rates in schizophrenia range from 70% to 90% and contribute to an increased incidence of cardiovascular and respiratory disorders. Anxiety, depression, and suicide co-occur co frequently in schizophrenia. Anxiety may be a response to symptoms, uh, e.g. hallucinations or circumstances, e.g. isolation, overstimulation, and may worsen schizophrenia symptoms and prognosis. Almost half of all persons with schizophrenia attempt suicide at some point in their lives, and approximately 10% succeed. Both depression and suicide attempts can occur at any point in the illness. Physical health illnesses are more common among people with schizophrenia than in the general population. The risk of premature death is 1.6 to 2.8 times greater than that of the general population on average. Patients with schizophrenia die 28 years prematurely due to disorders such as hypertension, 22%, obesity, 24%, cardiovascular disease, 21%, diabetes, 12%, chronic obstruction pulmonary disease, 10%, and trauma, 6%. People with psychotic disorders may be at greater risk due to apathy, poor health habits, medications, see discussion of metabolic syndrome later in this chapter, or failure to recognize signs of illness. Owing to poverty, Stigma or stereotyping, e.g. emergency department personnel, assuming that because the patient has a psychotic disorder, his chest pain is imaginary, they may not receive adequate health care. Polydipsia can lead to fatal water intoxication, indicated by hy hyponatremia, confusion, worsening psychotic symptoms, and ultimately coma. It is characterized by a seemingly insatiable thirst that results in a dangerous intake of water, it occurs in 7% of, in, of inpatients with schizophrenia. Factors that contribute to ac excess water intake include taking antipsychotic medication, causes dry mouth, compulsive behavior, and neuroendocrine abnormalities. Etiology. Schizophrenia typically manifests early in adulthood. It becomes chronic or recurrent in at least 80% of those who develop it on average. Everyone has about a 0.7% percent chance of developing schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a complicated disorder. In fact, we call schizophrenia actually, in fact, what we call schizophrenia actually may be a group of disorders with common but varying features and multiple overlapping etiologies. What is known is that brain chemistry, structure, and activity are different in a person with schizophrenia than in a person who does not have the disorder. The scientific consensus is that schizophrenia can occur when multiple inherited gene abnormalities combine with non-genetic factors, e.g. viral infections, birth injuries, prenatal malnutrition. 
altering the structure of the brain, affecting the brain's neurotransmitter systems, and or injuring the brain directly. This is called the diathesis stress model of schizophrenia. Biological factors. Genetic. Schizophrenia and schizophrenia-like symptoms such as eccentric thinking occur at an, incre incre at an increased rate in relative relatives of individuals with schizophrenia, according to Smoller and colleagues. Compared to the usual 1% risk in the population, having a first-degree relative with schizophrenia increases the risk to 10%. There is a variability of expression of schizophrenia depending upon environmental factors, schizoaffective disorder, and Cluster A personality disorders are more common in relatives of people with schizophrenia. Concordance rates in twins. How often one twin will have the disorder when the other one has it is about 50% for identical twins and 50% for fraternal twins. Evidence suggests that multiple genes on different chromosomes interact with each other in complex ways to create vulnerability for schizophrenia. Genes potentially linked to schizophrenia continue to be identified, suggesting a high degree of complexity. Neurobiological Dopamine Theory The dopamine theory of schizophrenia is derived from the study of the action of the first antipsychotic drugs collectively known as conventional or first-generation antipsychotics, e.g. Hal haloperidol and uh, chlorpromazine. These drugs block the activity of dopamine 2 D2 receptors in the brain, limiting the activity of, of do dopamine and reducing some of the symptoms of schizophrenia. Amphetamines, cocaine, methylphenidate or Ritalin, and levodopa increase the activity of dopamine in the brain and in biologically susceptible persons and in biologically susceptible persons may precipitate schizophrenia's onset. If schizophrenia is already present there may be they may be exasperate they may exasperate its symptoms however because the dopamine blocking agents do not alleviate all the symptoms of schizophrenia the dopamine hypothesis is no longer considered conclusive other neuro neurochemical hypotheses a newer class of drugs collectively known as atypical or second generation antipsychotics blocks serotonin as well as dopamine which suggest suggests that serotonin may play a role in schizophrenia as well if we can better understand how atypical agents modulate the expression and targeting of 5-hydrotryptamine 2A or 5-HT2A and its receptors, we may better understand schizophrenia. <coughs> Researchers have long been aware that phencyclidine, pip piperidine, PCP, induces a state closely resembling schizophrenia. This observation led to interest in the N-methyl D-aspartate or NMDA uh, receptor complex and the possible role of glutamate in the pathophysiology of schizophrenia. Glutamate is a clinical or glutamate is a crucial neurotransmitter during periods of neuromaturation, abnormal maturation of the central nervous system. Uh, is considered is considered to be a center, central factor contributing to schizophrenia. Brain structure abnormalities. Disruptions in communication pathways in the brain are thought to be severe in schizophrenia. Therefore, it is conceivable that structural abnormalities cause disruption of the brain's functioning. Using brain imaging techniques, computed tomography, CT, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI, and positron emission tomography, PET, um, researchers have provided substantial evidence that some people with schizophrenia have structural brain abnormalities, including enlargement of the lateral cerebral ventricles, third ventricle dilation, and or ventricular asymmetry, reduced cortical frontal lobe, hippocampal, and or cere cerebellar volumes, increased size of the sulci or fissures on the surface of the brain. In addition, MRI and CT scans demonstrate lower brain volume and more cerebrospinal fluid in people with schizophrenia. PET scans also show a lowered rate of blood flow and glucose metabolism in the frontal lobes, which governs planning, abstract thinking, social 
adjustment, and decision making, all of which are affected in schizophrenia. Figure 3 5 in Chapter 3 shows a PET scan demonstrating reduced brain activity in the frontal lobe of a patient with schizophrenia. Such structural changes may worsen in the disorder as the disorder continues. Post-mortem studies on individuals with schizophrenia reveal a reduced volume of gray matter in the brain, especially in the temporal and frontal lobes. Those with the most tissue loss, tissue, tissue loss had the worst symptoms, e.g. hallucinations, delusions, bizarre thoughts, and depression. Psychological and environmental factors. <coughs> A number of stressors, particularly those occurring during vulnerable periods of neurological development, are believed to combine with genetic vulnerabilities to produce schizophrenia. Reducing, reducing such stress, stressors is believed to have the potential to reduce the severity of the disorder or even prevent it. Considering culture, the stigma of schizophrenia. Miss Chow, Miss Chow, a 25-year-old woman, Left in China, left China for the United States six months ago to join her husband. In China, she lived with her parents and had learned English. She was shy and looked to her parents and later to her husband for guidance and support. Shortly after arrival in the United States, her mother developed pneumonia and died. Miss Chow later told her husband that if she had stayed in China, her mother would not have become ill and that evil would not now would now come to their one-year-old child because Miss Chow had not taken proper care of her mother. Mrs. Chow became increasingly lethargic, staring into space and mumbling to herself. When Mr. Chow asked who she was talking to, she answered, my mother. <coughs> Mr. Chow realized that something was terribly wrong with his wife, yet he was reluctant to ask either relatives or professionals for assistance since mental illness is strongly stigmatized in the Chinese culture. In fact, mental illness may be believed to be a punishment for personal failings. Miss Chow was finally admitted to a psychiatric unit when Mr. Chow noticed she had quit eating and taking care of herself and was certainly unable to care for their child. During her admission assessment, she sat motionless and mute. Mr. Nolan, her primary nurse, noticed that after he checked her pulse her arm remained in midair until he lowered it for her mrs chow was unkempt and pale and her skin turgor was poor mr nolan also spoke with mr chow who was visibly distressed by his wife's condition he discovered that mr chow blamed himself for his wife's illness because his recollection of the united because his for his wife's illness because his recollection or sorry, relocation to the United States prevented her from caring for her ailing mother. He agreed with his wife that their mutual feelings placed their child at risk of retribution. He conceded that coming to the hospital had been very difficult owing to embarrassment both about his wife's mental illness and his own belief that he should not burden others with the care of himself and his wife. Mr. Nolan helped Mr. Chow recognize that in U.S. culture, family members shared caregiving burdens, professional help was more available, and stigmatization was less intense. Gradually, Mr. Chow's distress lessened as he came to appreciate that he would not have to carry the level of burden he had anticipated. As Mrs. Chow's psychosis abated, both she and Mr. Chow came to ascribe more cap culpability for the illness to fate, reducing their burden of self-blame. They agreed to meet with Ch a Chinese-American healer who helped them integrate the beliefs and resources of their original and adopted cultures, uh, further reducing their guilt and distress. <coughs> Prenatal stressors. A history of pregnancy or birth complications is associated with an increased risk for schizophrenia. Prenatal risk factors include viral infection, poor nutrition, hypoxia, and exposure to toxins. Psychological trauma to the mother during pregnancy, e.g. the death of a relative, can also contribute to the development of schizophrenia. Other risk factors include a father older than 35 at the child's conception and being born during late winter or early spring. Hmm. Weird. Psychological stressors. 
Although there is no evidence that stress alone causes schizophrenia, stress increases cortisol levels, imp impeding hypothalamic development and causing other changes that may precipitate the illness in vulnerable individuals. Schizophrenia often manifests at times of development and family stress, such as beginning college or moving away from one's family. Social, psychological, and physical stressors may play a significant role in both the severity and course of the disorder and the person's quality of life. Other factors increasing the risk of schizophrenia include cannabis use and exposure to psychological trauma or social defeat. Environmental stressors. Environmental factors are also believed to contribute to the development of schizophrenia in vulnerable persons. These include exposure to social adversity, ad adversity, e.g. living in chronic poverty or high crime environments, and migration to or growing up in a foreign culture. Course of the disorder. The onset of symptoms or forewarning prodromal symptoms may appear a month to a year before the first psychotic break or full-blown manifestations of the illness. Such symptoms represent a clear deterioration in previous functioning. The course thera thereafter typically includes recurrent exasperations separated by periods of reduced or dormant symptoms. Occasionally, a person will have a single episode of schizophrenia without recurrences or have several episodes and none thereafter. For most patients, however, schizophrenia is a chronic or recurring disorder which, like diabetes or heart disease, is managed but rarely cured. Frequently, the history of a person with schizophrenia reveals that prior to the illness, the person was socially awkward, lo lonely, perhaps depressed, and expressed himself or herself in vague, odd, or unrealistic ways. In this prodromal fra phase, complaints about anxiety, phobias, obsessions, dissociative features, and compulsions may be noted. As anxiety mounts, indications of a thought disorder become evident. Concentration, memory, and completion of school or job-related work deteriorate. Intrusive thoughts, mind wandering, and the need to devote more time to maintaining one's thoughts are reported. A person may feel that something strange or wrong is happening. Events are misinterpreted and mystical or symbolic meanings may be given to ordinary events. For example, the patient may think that certain colors have special powers or that a song on the radio is a message from God. Discerning others' emotions becomes more difficult and other people's actions or words may be mistaken for signs of hostility or evidence of harmful intent. Sexuality is frequently altered in psychotic disorders. Preoccupation with homosexual themes may occur, particularly in people with paranoid schizophrenia. Doubts regarding sexual identity, exaggerated sexual needs, altered sexual performance, and fears of intimacy are prominent in schizophrenia. A person may engage in public masturbatory behavior. Prognostic considerations. For the majority of patients, most symptoms can be at least somewhat controlled through medications and psychosocial interventions. With support and effective treatments, many people with schizophrenia experience a good quality of life and success within their families, occupations, and other roles. Associates may not even realize the person has schizophrenia. However, in most cases, schizophrenia does not respond fully to available treatments, leaving residual symptoms and causing varying degrees of dis disability. Some cases require repeated or lengthy inpatient care or institu inst institutionalization an abrupt onset of symptoms is usually a favorable prognostic sign, and those with good premorbid social, sexual, and occupational functioning have a, have a greater chance for a good remission or a complete recovery. A slow, insidious onset over two to three years is more ominous, and the younger one is at the onset of, and the younger one is at the onset of schizophrenia, the more discouraging the prognosis. A childhood history of with withdrawn, reclusive, eccentric, intense behavior is also an unfavorable diagnostic sign, as is a preponderance of negative symptoms. Phases of Schizophrenia Schizophrenia usually progresses through predictable phases, although the presenting symptoms during a given phase and the length of the phase can vary widely. 
The phases of schizophrenia are as follows. Phase 1. Acute. Onset or exasperation of florid disruptive symptoms, e.g. hallucinations, delusions, apathy, withdrawal. Uh, with resultant loss of functional abilities, increased care of hospitalization may be required. Phase 2. Stabilization. Symptoms are diminished and there is movement toward one's previous level of functioning. Baseline. Day, uh, day hospitalization or care in a residual crisis center or a uh, supervised group may be needed. Phase 3. Maintenance. The patient is at or near baseline or pre-morbid functioning. Symptoms are absent or diminished. Level of functioning allows the patient to live in the community. Ideally, recovery with a few or no residual symptoms has occurred. Most persons in this phase live in their own residences. Some clinicians also designate an earlier prodromal or pre-psychotic phase in which subtle symptoms or deficits associated with schizophrenia are present. Such symptoms may or may not herald the onset of schizophrenia. Application of the nursing process assessment. Nursing assessment of patients who have or may have or may have a psychotic disorder focuses largely on symptoms coping, Sym symptoms coping, functioning, and safety. Assessment involves interviewing the patient and observing behavior and other outward manifestations of the, of the disorder. It also should include mental status and spiritual, cultural, biological, psycho psychological, social, and environmental elements. Sound therapeutic communication skills and understanding of the disorder and the ways patients may be experiencing their world and establishing trustworthiness in a therapeutic nurse-patient relationship all strengthen the assessment. During the pre-psychotic phase, Experts believe that detection and treatment of symptoms that may warn of schizophrenia's onset lessens the risk of developing this, the disorder or the severity of the disorder if it does develop. A delay in diagnosis and treatment allows the psychotic process to become more entrenched. It can also result in relational work, housing, and school problems. Therefore, early assessment plays a key role in improving the prognosis for persons with schizophrenia. This form of primary prevention involves monitoring those at high risk, e.g. children or parents with schizophrenia, for symptoms such as abnormal social development and cognitive dysfunction, intervening to reduce stressors, i.e. reduce to avoid exposure to triggers, enhancing social and coping skills, i.e. build resiliency, and prophylactic antipsychotic medication administration may also be of benefit. Similarly, in patients who have already developed this, the disorder, Minimizing the onset and duration of relapses is believed to improve the prognosis. Research suggests that each relapse of psychosis, there is an increase in residual dysfunction and deterioration. Recognition of the early warning signs of relapse, such as reduced sleep and concentration, followed by close monitoring and intensification of treatment, is essential. For this reason, adherence to antipsychotics can be more important than the risk of side effects because most side effects are reversible, whereas the consequences of relapse may not be. General Assessment Not all people with schizophrenia, or even people with the same subtype of the disorder, have the same symptoms, and some of the symptoms of schizophrenia are also found in other disorders. 15 2. <coughs> Excuse me. Figure 15-2 describes the four main symptoms, uh, symptom groups of schizophrenia. Um, figure 15-2, there's positive symptoms, which are hallucina hallucinations, delusions, disorganized speech or associative looseness, and bizarre, and bizarre be behavior. Those are the positive symptoms. Negative symptoms, blunted effect, poverty of thought, elogia, loss of motivation or avolition, and inst inability to experience pleasure or joy, and that's anhedonia. Um, affective symptoms are dysphoria, suicidality, and hopelessness. And cognitive symptoms are inattention, easily distracted, impaired memory, poor problem-solving skills, poor decision-making skills, logical thinking, and impaired judgment. All dimensions after the individual's... Um, so there's another 
box that says all dimensions alter the individual's ability to work, interpersonal relationships, self-care abilities, social functioning, and quality of life. Okay, so positive symptoms. Positive sim symptoms, the presence of something that is not normally present, like hallucination, delusions, bizarre behavior, paranoia. Negative symptoms are the absence of something that should be present but is not, e.g. apathy, uh, lack of motivation, anhedonia, and poor thought process. Cognitive symptoms are abnor abnormalities in how a person thinks, and affective symptoms are symptoms involving emotions in their expression. So that explains those. The positive symptoms usually appear early in the illness, and their dramatic nature captures our attention and often precipitates hospitalization. They are also the symptoms most lay people associate... Oh, one moment. Associate with insanity, making schizophrenia disorder the disorder most associated with being crazy. However, positive psychotic symptoms are perhaps less important prognostically and usually respond to antipsychotic medication. The negative symptoms, however, tend to be persistent and crippling because they render the person inert and unmotivated. Box 15.2 gives a more detailed listing of the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Box 15.2, positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Positive symptoms, hallucinations, auditory, voice commenting, voice con conversing, tactile, olfactory, gustatory, visual, delusions, persecutory, jealousy, grandiose, religious, somatic, reference, being controlled, thought broadcasting, insertion, without withdrawal, Oof. bizarre behavior, inappropriate clothing, appearance, and social sexual behavior, aggressive agitated behavior, repetitive stereotyped behavior, positive formal thought disorder and speech patterns, disorganization, associative looseness, flight of ideas, or FOI, um, a rapid or pr pressured speech, Tangi tangentiality, tangentiality, uh, blocking, incoherence, illogicality, circumstantiality, distractibility, clang associations, concreteness, memory impairment, inappropriate affect, Congruent, uh, incongruent affect for situation, bizarre affect, negative symptoms, affective flattening, blunted or flattened affect, paucity of expression, expressive gestures, lack of vocal inflections, elogia, poverty of speech, poverty of content of speech, abolition or apathy, decreased spontaneous movement and behavior, inattention, inattention to grooming and hygiene, reduced task completion at work, home or school, physical energia, energia. anhedonia, a sociality, poor eye contact, few recreational interests or activities, reduced sexual interest or activity, impaired intimacy and closeness, Reduced mirthfulness, joy, few relationships with friends or peers, attention deficits, social inattentiveness, impaired task com completion, other, reduced ability to read others' emotions or intent. Positive symptoms. Positive symptoms such as hallucinations, delusions, bizarre behavior, and paranoia are associated with acute onset, normal pre-morbid functioning, normal social functioning during remission, normal CT findings, normal neuropsychological test results, favorable response to antipsychotic medication. The positive symptoms presented here are categorized as alterations in thinking, speech, perception, and behavior. Alterations in thinking. All people experience occasional and momentary errors in thinking, e.g., why are all these lights turning red when I'm already late? 
Someone must be trying to slow me down. But most can catch and correct in the error by using intact reality testing. People with impaired reality testing, however, maintain the error, which contributes to delusions. Delusions are false, fixed beliefs that cannot be corrected by reasoning. A person experiencing delusions is convinced that what he or she believes it to be real is real. Student nurses sometimes try unsuccessfully to argue a patient out of a delusion by offering evidence of reality. This may irritate the patient and slow the development of, therapeutic, of a therapeutic relationship. Table 15.1 provides definitions and examples of frequent types of delusions. Table 15.1, Summary of Delusions. Uh, delusions based on control. Definition. Believing that another person, group, or people, or external force controls thoughts, feelings, impulses, or behavior. Example. Brian always wears a hat so that the aliens don't insert thoughts into his brain. Ideas of reference. Giving personal significance to trivial events. Perceiving events as relating to you when they are not. Uh, example. When Maria saw staff talking together, she believed they were plotting against her. Um, this one is persecution. Believing one is being singled out f for harm by others. This belief often takes the form of a plot by people in power. Example, Peter believed that the Secret Service was planning to kill him by poisoning his food. Therefore, he would only eat food he, brought from, he bought from machines. Uh, delusions of grandeur, believing that one is a very powerful or in, or important person. Um, this is an example. Sam believed he was a famous playwright and tennis pro. Somatic delusions, believing that the body is changing in an unusual way, e.g. rotting inside. Example, David told the doctor that his heart had stopped and his insides were rotting away. Erotomania, believing that another person desires you romantically. <coughs> Although he barely knew her, Mary insisted that Mr. Johnson would marry her if only his current wife would stop interfering. Jealousy delusions, believing that one's mate is unfaithful. Example, Harry wrongly accused his girlfriend of going out with other men. His proof was that she came home from work late twice that week, even though... The girl's boss, the girl's, the girlfriend's boss explained that everyone had worked late. A false belief held and maintained as true, regardless of evidence to the contrary. This does not include sharing unusual beliefs maintained by one's culture or subculture. That's just a note. Um, about 75% of people with schizophrenia experience delusions at some time. The most common delusions are persecutory, grandiose, or those involving religious or hypochondriacal ideas. A delusion may be a response to anxiety or reflect areas of concern for a person. For example, someone with poor self-esteem may believe he is Beethoven or, or an emissary from God, uh, allowing him to feel more powerful or important. Looking for and addressing such underlying themes or needs can be a key nursing intervention. At times, delusions hold a kernel of truth. One patient repeatedly told the staff that the mafia was out to kill him. Later, staff learned that he had been selling drugs, had not paid his contacts, and gang members were trying to find him to hurt or even kill him. Concrete thinking refers to an impaired ability to think uh, abstractly. For example, the nurse might ask what brought the patient to the hospital, and the patient might answer, concretely, a cab, uh, rather than explaining that he had attempted suicide. Concreteness is often assessed through the patient's interpretation of proverbs. A concrete interpretation of the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence would be that side gets more sun, so it's greener there. <coughs> Concreteness reduces one's ability to understand and address abstract concepts such as love or the passage of time. Alterations in speech. Associations are the threads that tie one thought logically to another. In associative looseness, these threads are interrupted or illogically connected. Thinking 
becomes ha haphazard, illogical, and difficult to follow. Nurse, are you going to the picnic today? Patient, I'm not an elephant hunter. No tiger teeth for me. At times, the nurse may be able to decipher or decode the patient's messages and begin to understand the patient's feelings and needs. Any exchange in which a person feels understood is useful. Therefore, the nurse might respond to the patient in this way. Are you saying that you're afraid to go out with the others today? Yeah, no tiger getting me today. Sometimes it is not possible to understand that the patient may mean well, what the patient may mean because the patient's speech is too fragmented. For example, I have a patient. I sang out for my mother. For this to hell I went. These little hills a hop aboard. Share the Christmas mice spread. The devil will be washed away. That's poetic. If the nurse does not understand what the patient is saying, it is important to let the patient know this. Clear messages and honesty are an important part of working effectively in psychiatric mental health nursing. An honest response lets the patient know that the nurse does not understand, would like to understand, and can be trusted to be honest. Neologisms are made-up words, or idiosyncratic uses of existing words, that have meaning for the patient but a different or non-existent meaning to others. I was going to tell him the mannerologies of this hospital won't do that this eccentric use of words represents disorganized thinking and interferes with communication. Echolalia is the pathological repeating of another's words and is often seen in catatonia. Nurse, Mary, come get your medication. Mary, come get your medication. Uh, echopraxia is the mimicking of movements of another. It is also seen in catatonia. catatonia. So, echolalia is repeating, echopraxia is mimicking the movements. Clang association is the choice of words based on their sound rather than their meaning, often rhyming and sometimes having a similar beginning sound. On the track, have a Big Mac, click, clack, clutch, close. Clanging uh, may also be seen in neurological disorders. Word salad is a jumble of words that is meaningless to the listener and perhaps to the speaker as well because of an extreme level of disorganization. <coughs> Excuse me. Alterations in perception. Alterations in perception involve errors in how one perceives reality. The most common form of altered perception in psychosis is hallucination, but depersonalization or derealization are sometimes experienced as well. Depersonalization is a non-specific feeling that a person has lost his or her identity and that the self is different or unreal. People may feel that body parts do not belong to them or may suddenly sense that their body has drastically changed. For example, a patient may see her, her finger as snakes or her arms as rotting wood. Derealization is a false perception that the environment has changed. For example, everything seems bigger or smaller or familiar surroundings have become somehow strange and unfamiliar. Both depersonalization and derealization can be interpreted as loss of ego boundaries, sometimes called loose ego boundaries. Hallucinations involve perceiving a sensory experience for which no external stimulus exists, e.g. hearing a voice when no one is speaking. Hallucinations differ from illusions in that illusions are misperceptions or misinterpretations of a real experience. For example, a man sees a coat on a coat rack and believes it is a bear about to attack. He does see something real, but misinterprets what it is. Causes of hallucinations include psychiatric disorders, drug abuse medications, uh, organic disorders, hyperthermia, toxicity, e.g. digitalis, and other conditions. Types of hallucination include... Auditory, hearing voices or sounds, visual, seeing persons or things, olfactory, smelling odors, gustatory, experiencing tastes, tactile, feeling body sensations. <laughs> Table 15.2 provides definitions and examples of these types of hallucinations. <sighs> Auditory hallucinations are experienced by up to 15% of persons with psychotic disorders and 60% of people with schizophrenia at some time during their lives. Voices typically seem to come from outside the person's head and auditory processing areas of the brain are activated during auditory hallucinations 
just as they are when a genuine external sound is heard. Hmm. This abnormal activation may cause hallucinations, but another leading theory is that voices are a misperception of one's internally generated conversation. John Nash, the world-renowned mathematician portrayed in the film A Beautiful Mind, describes the voices he heard during the acute phase of his illness. I thought of the voices as something a little different from aliens. I thought of them more like angels. It's really my subconscious talking. It was really that. I know that now. Voices may be of persons familiar or unknown, single or multiple. They may be perceived as supportive and pleasant or derogatory and frightening. Voices commenting on the person's behavior or conversing with the person are most common. A person who hears voices when no one is present often struggles to understand the experience, sometimes developing related delusions to explain the voices, e.g. the patient may believe the voices are from God, the devil, or deceased relatives. Persons with chronic hallucinations may attempt to cope by drowning them out with loud music or competing with them by talking loudly. Command hallucinations are voices that direct the person to take an action. <coughs> All hallucinations must be assessed and monitored carefully because the voices may command the person to hurt self or others. For example, voices might command a patient to jump out the window or take a knife and kill my child. Command hallucinations are often terrifying and may, be, and may herald a psychiatric emergency. In all cases, it is essential to assess what the patient hears, the patient's ability to recognize the hallucination as real or not real, and the patient's ability to resist any commands. Patients may falsely deny hallucinations, requiring behavioral assessment to support, validate, or refute uh, the patient's report. Outward indications of possible hallucinations include turning or tilting the head as if to listen to someone, suddenly stopping current activity as if interrupted, and moving the lips silently. Visual hallucinations occur less frequently in schizophrenia and are more likely to occur in organic disorders such as acute alcohol withdrawal or dementia. Olfactory, tactile, or gustatory hallucinations are unusual. When present, other physical sources should be investigated. Boundary impairment is an impaired ability to sense where one's body ends and others' bodies begin. For example, a patient might drink another's beverage, believing that because it is in the, his vicinity, it is his. Alterations in behavior. Alterations in behavior include bizarre and agitated behaviors involving such things as stilted, rigid demeanor or eccentric dress, grooming, and rituals. Other behavior changes seen in schizophrenia include catatonia, a pronounced increase or de decrease in the rate and amount of movement. The most common form is stuporous behavior in which the person moves little or not at all. Table 15 to s a summary of hallucinations. Um, I'm just going to skip it because I just kind of went over all that. Um, motor retardation is a pronounced slowing of movement. Motor agitation, excited behavior such as uh, running or pacing rapidly, often in response to internal or external stimuli. It can pose a risk to others and to the patient who is at risk for exhaustion, collapse, and even death. Stereotyped behaviors. Repeated motor behaviors that do not presently serve a logical purpose. Automatic obedience. The performance by a catatonic patient of all simple commands in a robot-like fashion. Waxy flexibility. The extended maintenance of posture usually seen in catatonia. For example, the nurse raises the patient's arm 
and the patient continues to hold this position in a statue-like manner. That's waxy flexibility. Negativism, akin to resistance, but may not be intentional. In active negativism, the patient does the opposite of what he or she is told to do. Passive negativism is a failure to do what is requested. Impaired impulse control, a reduced ability to resist one's impulses. Examples include socially inappropriate behaviors, such as grabbing another cigarette, throwing food on the floor, pushing staff, and changing TV channels while others are watching. Negative symptoms. Negative symptoms develop slowly and are those that most interfere with a person's adjustment and ability to cope. Negative symptoms impede one's ability to initiate and maintain conversation in relationships, obtain and maintain a job, make decisions and follow through on plans, maintain adequate hygiene and grooming. Negative symptoms contribute to poor social functioning and social withdrawal. During the acute phase, they are difficult to assess because positive symptoms such as delusions and hallucinations dominate. Selected negative symptoms are outlined in Table 15.3. Affect is the observable behavior that indicates a person's emotional state in schizophrenia. Affect may not always con coincide with inner emotions. Affect in schizophrenia can usually be categorized in one or four ways. There's flat, which is immobile or blank facial expression, blunted, reduced or minimal emotional response, inappropriate, emotional response incongruent with the tone of circumstances of the situation, e.g. a man laughs when told that his father has died, uh, bizarre, the odd illogical emotional state that is grossly, grossly inappropriate or unfounded, especially prominent in disorganized schizophrenia and in includes grimacing and giggling. Cognitive symptoms. Cognitive symptoms represent the third symptom dimension and are evident in most people with schizophrenia. They involve difficulty with attention, memory, information processing, cognitive flexibility, and executive functions e.g. decision-making, judgment, planning, and problem-solving. These impairments can leave the patient unable to pr manage personal health care, hold a job, initiate or maintain a support system, or live alone. Negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Affective blunting. A, reduce, a reduction in the expression, expressive range and intensity of affect. In flat effect, no facial expression is, is present. Anergia, or anergia, lack of energy, passivity, lack of persistence at work or school. Anhedonia, inability to experience pleasure in activities that usually produce it, result of profound emotional barren, barrenness. Avolition, reduced motivation, inability to initiate tasks such as social contracts, grooming, and other activities of daily living PDLs. poverty of content of speech while adequate in amount speech conveys little information because of vagueness or superficiality poverty of speech reduced amount of speech responses range from brief to one word answers thought blocking a sudden interruption in the thought process usually due to internal stimuli. Example, a patient abruptly stops talking in the middle of a sentence and remains silent. What just happened now? asked the nurse. Patient, I forgot what I was saying. Something took my thoughts away. Affective symptoms. Affective symptoms, the fourth dimension, are common in increased patient suffering. Ass assessment for depression is crucial because it may herald an impending relapse increased substance abuse, increased suicide risk, further impairs functioning. Self-assessment. Working with individuals with schizophrenia produces strong emotional reactions in most healthcare workers. The patient's intensely anxious, lonely, de dependent, and distrustful presentations evoke similar intense, uncomfortable, and frightening emotions in others.
the chronicity repeated exasperations and slow response to treatment many patients experience can lead to feelings of helplessness and powerlessness in staff patient behavior especially violent behavior can produce strong emotional responses called counter transference such as fear or anger see chapter 9 without support and the opportunity and willingness to explore these feelings with more experienced staff the nurse may adopt non-therapeutic behaviors denial withdrawal patient avoidance and anger most commonly these behaviors thwart the patient's progress and undermine the nurse's self-esteem comments such as these patients are hopeless and all you can do is babysit these people are indications of unrecognized and unresolved countertransference that if left uncorrected, interfere with both treatment and work satisfaction. Examining whether one's expectations of a patient are realistic and seeking new ways of helping patients can help staff overcome feelings of helplessness and reduce countertransference. <coughs> patients may experience fear, stigma, or shame related to their mental illness, leading them to conceal some aspects of their experience. Negativism and elogia, reduced verbal, verbalization, can also limit patient responses. Many patients with schizophrenia experience anosognosia, an inability to realize they are ill that is caused by the illness itself. The resulting lack of insight can make assessment and treatment challenging, delaying completion of a full assess assessment and requiring additional skills on the part of the nurse. Selected techniques that may help you overcome these challenges can be found in Table 15.4. Assessment Guidelines, Schizophrenia, and Other Psychotic Disorders 1. Determine if the patient has had a medical workup. Are there any indications of medical problems that might mimic psychosis, e.g. digitalis or uh, anticholinergic toxicity, brain trauma, drug intoxication, delirium, fever? 2. Assess whether the patient abuses or is dependent on alcohol or drugs. 3. Assess for risk to self or others. 4. Assess for command hallucination, e.g. voices telling the person to harm self or another. If present, ask the patient, do you recognize the voices? Do you believe the voices are real? Do you plan to follow the command? A positive response to any of these questions suggests an increased risk that the patient will act on the commands. 5. Assess the patient's belief system. Is it fragmented or poorly organized? Is it systemized? Are the beliefs delusional? If yes, then does the patient feel that he, that he or loved ones are being threatened or in danger? Does the patient feel the need to act against a person or organization to protect or avenge himself or loved ones? A positive response to either of these questions suggests an increased risk of danger to others. Assess for suicide risk. That's number six. <coughs> Excuse me. Seven, assess for ability to ensure self-safety, addressing adequacy of food and fluid intake, hygiene and self-care, handling of potentially hazard activities such as smoking and cooking, ability to transport self safely, impulse control and judgment, Appropriate dress for weather conditions. Number eight, assess for co occurring disorders like depression, anxiety, substance abuse or dependency, medical disorders, especially brain trauma, toxicity, delirium, cardiovascular disease, obesity, and diabetes. Nine, assess medications the patient has been prescribed, whether and how the patient is taking the medication, and what factors, e.g., cost, mistrust of staff, side effects, are affecting adherence. 10. Assess for the presence and severity of positive and negative symptoms. Complete a mental status ex examination, noting which symptoms are present, how they affect functioning, and how the patient is managing them. 11. Assess the patient's insight, knowledge of the illness, relationships and support systems, other coping resources and strengths. 12. Assess the family's knowledge and uh, of and re response to the patient's illness and its symptoms. Are family members overprotective, hostile, anxious? Are they familiar and with family support groups and respite, respite resources? Diagnosis. 
People with schizophrenia have multiple disturbing and disabling symptoms that require a multifaceted approach to care and treatment of both this patient and the family. Table 15.5 lists potential nursing diagnoses for a person with schizophrenia. Outcomes identification. Desired outcomes vary with the phase vary with the phase of the illness. Nursing outcomes classification NOC is a useful guide. Ideally, outcomes should focus on enhancing strengths and minimizing the effects of the patient's deficits and symptoms. Outcomes should be consistent with the recovery model, which stresses hope, living a full and productive life, and eventually eventual recovery rather than on focusing on controlling symptoms and adapting to disability. Table 15.5 Interventions for Overcoming Obstacles to Assessment Intervention Use emp empathic comments and observations to prompt the patient to provide information. Rationale em Empathy conveys understanding and builds trust and rapport. Example It must be difficult to find yourself in a psych hospital. Patient Yes, I'm frightened. Intervention. Minimize questioning, especially close-ended questioning. Rationale. Extended questioning can increase suspicion and closed questioning questions elicit minimal information. Um, seek data uh, conversationally using prompts and open-ended questions. Uh, example. Could you please tell me more about... Uh, Tell me what life has been like for you. Okay. Directly but supportively intervention. Directly but supportively seek the need information. The needed information explaining the reasons for the assessment. Um, being direct but supportive conveys genuineness, builds rapport, and helps reduce anxiety. Example: I know we have not known each other very long, but you seem very sad, and sometimes sad people think about hurting themselves so it is it is important for me to find out if you are safe have you ever thought about hurting yourself intervention judiciously use indirect supportive therapeutic confrontation rationale blunt contra contradiction or premature confrontation increases resistance example i realize admitting to voices might be difficult to to do but although you say you do not hear voices. I notice you talking as if to others when no one is there. Intervention. Seek other data to support, validate this patient's report. Obtain further history from third parties, past medical records, and other treatment providers when possible, preferably with the patient's permission. Pr uh, prioritize the data you seek and avoid seeking non-essential data. Rationale. Patients may be un unable or unwilling to provide information fully and reliably. Validating their reports assures the validity of the assessment. Uh, patients may have limited tolerance of the assessment interview and answer only a limited amount of inquiries. Seeking non-essential information does not benefit the patient or assessment. And some examples would be, your brother reports he works at a factory. Is that your understanding? Or a patient, I hate school. I wish I'd they'd all die. Nurse, this is the less therapeutic. Which school do you go to? Uh, more therapeutic. Be things would be better if they. Things would be better if they were dead. Paraphrasing prompts patients elaboration, and confirmation refutation of the comment. Table 15.5, Potential Nursing Diagnosis for Schizophrenia. Symptom, hears voices that others do not. Nursing diagnosis. Uh, these, these first ones are the positive symptoms. So, hears voices that others do not. That would be disturbed sensory perception auditory. Hears voices telling him or her to hurt self or others. Command hallucinations. That would be risk for directed violence. Risk for other directed violence. A risk for self-directed violence or a risk for other directed violence. Delusions would be disturbed thought processes. Uh, shows loose association of ideas or associative looseness. That would be disturbed thought process. Uh, conversation is derailed by unnecessary and tedious details. That would be impaired verbal communication.
or um, conversation is derailed by unnecessary and tedious details, also called circumstantiality. Negative symptoms. Uncommunicative, withdrawn, social isolation, uh, express feelings of rejection or aloneness, lies in bed all day, positions back to door, that's impaired social interaction, uh, risk for loneliness, um, talks about self as bad or no good, that's chronic low self-esteem, feels guilty because of bad thoughts, extremely sensitive to real or perceived slights, risk for self-directed violence, shows lack of energy, energia, that would be ineffective coping, shows lack of motivation, abolition, it would be self-care deficit, bathing, dressing, feeding, unable to initiate tasks, social contact, grooming, and other aspects of daily living. Also can cause constipation. Other, we have families and significant others become confused or overwhelmed, lack knowledge about disorder or treatment, feel powerless in coping with patient. Um, those would be compromised family coping, caregiver role strain, deficient knowledge, and stops taking medication because of uh, anosognosia, side effects, drug costs, mistrust of staff, stops going to therapy, is not supported in treatment by significant others, and that would be not adherence. Okay, those were nursing diagnoses. Note on the diagnosis. Um, oh, never mind. How about phases? So we have phase one, acute. For the acute phase, the overall goal is patient safety and medical stabilization. Therefore, if the patient is at risk for violence to self or others, initial outcome criteria address safety issues, e.g. patient refrains from self-injury. Another outcome is patient consistently labels hallucinations as not real, a symptom of illness. As not real, a symptom of illness. Table 15.6 gives selected short-term and intermediate indicators for the outcome, distorted thought, self-control. Table 15.6, knock outcome real uh, to distorted thought, related, oh, it's misspelled, to distorted thought, self-control. Nursing outcome and definition. Distorted thought, self-control, for distorted thought, self-control. Um, self-restraint of disruptions in perception, thought processes, and thought constant co content. Immediate indicators maintains a affect consistent with mood, interacts interacts appropriately, perceives environment and the ideas of others accurately, exhibits logical uh, thought flow patterns. Exhibits reality-based thinking. Exhibits appropriate thought content. Short-term indicators. Recognizes that hallucinations are, or delusions are occurring. Refrains from attending to and responding to hallucinations or delusions. Describes content of hallucinations or delusions. Reports decrease in hallucinations or delusions. Asks for validity of reality. Phase 2. Stabilization. Outcome criteria during phase two focus on helping the patient adhere to treatment, becoming stabilized on medications, and control or cope with symptoms. The outcomes target the negative system symptoms and may include ability to succeed in social, vocational, or self-care activities. Phase three, maintenance. Outcome criteria for phase three focus on maintaining achievement preventing relapse and achieving independence and a satisfactory quality of life. Planning. The planning of appropriate interventions is guided by the phase excuse me, of the illness and the strengths and needs of the patient. It is influenced by cultural considerations, available resources, and patient preferences. Phase 1. Acute. Hospitalization is indicated if the patient is considered a danger to self or others, refuses to eat or drink, or is too disorganized or otherwise impaired to function safely in the community without supervision. The planning process focuses on the best strategies to ensure patient safety and provides symptom stabilization. 
In discharge planning, the patient and multidisciplinary treatment team identify aftercare needs for follow-up and support. Discharge planning considers not only external factors such as the patient's living arrangements, economic resources, social supports, and family relationships, but also internal factors such as resilience and repertoire of coping skills. Because relapse can be devastating to the patient's circumstances, resulting in loss of employment, housing, and relationships, and worsen the long-term prognosis, vigorous efforts are made to connect the patient and family with, not simply refer them to, community resources that provide therapeutic programming and social, financial, and other needed support. Phase 2, stabilization slash phase 3, maintenance. Planning during the stabiliza stabilization and maintenance phases focuses on providing patient and family education and skills training, psychosocial education. Relapse prevention skills are vital. Planning, planning identifies interpersonal coping health care and vocational needs and addresses how and where these needs can best be met within the community. Implementation. Interventions are geared toward the phase of schizophrenia the patient is experiencing. For example, during the acute phase, the clinical focus is on crisis intervention, medication for symptom stabilization, and safety. Interventions are often hospital-based. However, many patients in the acute stage increasingly are being treated in the community. Phase 1. Acute settings. A number of factors that affect the choice of treatment setting include the following. Lo level of care restrictiveness needed to protect the person from harm to self or others, patient's needs for external structure and support, patient's ability to cooperate with treatment, need for a particular treatment available only in particular settings, need for treatment of a concurrent medical condition, availability of supportive others who can provide critical information and treatment history to staff, and permit sta <laughs> stabilization in less restrictive settings. The use of less restrictive and more cost-effective alternatives to hospitalization that work for many patients include partial hospitalization, patients sleep at home and attend treatment sessions, similar to what they would receive, uh, what they would receive if it admitted uh, during the day or evening. Residential crisis centers, patients who are unable to remain in the community but do not re require full inpatient services, can be admitted usually for one to 14 days to receive increased supervision, guidance, and medication stabi stabilization. Halfway houses. Patients li live in the community with a group of other patients sharing expenses and responsibilities. Staff are present in the house 24 hours a day, seven days a week to provide supervision and therapeutic activities. Day treatment programs. Patients reside in the community and attend structured programming during the day. These programs may include group and individual therapy, supervised activities, and specialized skill training. It is vital that staff will be aware of these and other community resources and make this information available to discharged patients and their families. Ideally, by directing, directly connecting them with these resources, patients and family members should be given telephone numbers and addresses of local support groups that are affiliated with the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI, NAMI. Other, <coughs> excuse me. other community resources include community mental health centers, usually providing medication services, day treatment, access to 24-hour emergency services, psychotherapy, psychoeducation, and case management. Home health services, supported employment programs wherein patients receive services from job training to on-site coaches who help them learn to succeed in the work environment, often via the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation, BVR. Peer-led services, e.g. drop-in centers, sometimes called clubhouses, that offer social contact, constructive activities, and sometimes employment opportunities. Family educational slash skills groups, e.g. NAMI's family-to-family uh, -family program, and respite care for caregivers. Interventions. Acute phase interventions include psychiatric, medical, and neurological evaluation, psychopharmacological treatment, support, psychoeducation and guidance, supervision and limit setting in the milieu. 
the length of hospitalization or other intensive treatment programs during the acute phase is often short days. As soon as the acute symptoms are adequately stabilized, the patient is discharged to the community where appropriate treatment can be continued during the stabilization and maintenance phases. Phase 2, Stabilization Phase 3, Maintenance. Effective long-term care of an individual with schizophrenia relies on a three-pronged approach, medication administration, adherence, and nursing intervention, and community support. Family psychoeducation, a key role of the nurse, is an essential intervention. All interventions and strategies are geared to the patient's strengths, culture, personal preferences, and needs. Milieu management. Effective hospital care provides one, protection from stressful or disruptive environments, and two, structure. Patients in the acute phase of schizophrenia show greater improvement in a structured milieu than on an open unit that allows more freedom. <coughs> Excuse me. Hospital al alternatives, e.g. crisis centers, also provide a structured milieu. A therapeutic milieu is consciously designed to maximize safety opportunities for learning skills, therapeutic activities, and access to resources. The milieu also dis provides guidance, supportive peer contact, and opportunities for practicing conflict resolution, stress reduction techniques, and dealing with symptoms. Activities and groups. Participation in activities and groups appropriate to the patient's level of functioning may decrease withdrawal, enhance motivation, mod modify unacceptable behaviors, develop friendships, and increase social competency. Activities such as drawing, reading poetry, and listening to music are used to focus conversation and promote the recognition and expression of feelings. Self-esteem is enhanced as patients experience successful task completion. Recreational Activities such as picnics and outings to stores and restaurants are not simply diversions. They teach constructive leisure skills, increase social comfort, facilitate growth in social concern and interactional skills, and enhance the ability to develop boundaries and limit sets and set limits on self and others. After discharge, group therapy can provide necessary structure within the patient's community milieu. Safety. A small percentage of patients with schizophrenia, especially during the acute phase, may exhibit a risk for physical violence. Typically, in response to hallucinations, delusions, paranoia, impaired judgment, or impulse control, or self-referentiality, meaning believing neutral, everyday occurrences carry special personal meaning. When the potential for violence exists, measures to protect the patient and others become the priority. Interventions include increasing staff supervision, reducing stimulation, e.g. noise and crowds, um, addressing paranoia and other contributing symptoms, providing constructive diversion and outlets for physical energy, teaching and practicing coping skills, implementing cognitive behavioral approaches, um, to correct unrealistic expectations or selectively extinguish aggression. Um, De-escalating tension verbally and when necessary using seclusion or chemical medication or physical restraints. Refer to chapter 25 for more detailed discussion of caring for the aggressive patient, seclusion and restraints. Counseling and communication techniques. Therapeutic communication techniques for patients with schizophrenia aim to lower the patient's anxiety, build trust, encourage clear communication by the patient, decrease defensiveness, encourage interaction, enhance self-esteem, and reinforce skills such as reality testing and assertiveness. It is important to remember that patients with schizophrenia may have memory impairment and require repetition. They may also have limited tolerance for interaction owing to the stimulation it creates. Therefore, shorter, less than 30 minutes, but frequent interactions may be more therapeutic. Interventions for paranoia and other selected presentations are discussed later in this chapter. Hallucinations. When a patient is having a hallucination, the nursing 
focus is on understanding the patient's experience and responses. Suicidal or homicidal themes or commands necessitate appropriate safety measures. For example, voices that tell the patient a particular individual plans to harm him may lead him to act aggressively against that person. One-to-one -one supervision of the patient or transfer of the potential victim to another unit is often essential. Hallucinations are real to the person who is experiencing them and may be distracting dur during nurse-patient interactions. Call the patient by name, speak simply but in a louder voice than usual, approach the patient in a non-threatening and non-judgmental manner, maintain eye contact, and redirect the patient's focus to the conversation as needed. Box 15.3 lists other techniques for communicating with patients experiencing hallucinations. Delusions. Delusions may be the patient's attempts to understand confusion and distorted experiences. They reflect the misperception of one's circumstances, which go uncorrected in schizophrenia due to impaired reality testing. When a nurse, when as a nurse you attempt to see the world through the eyes of the patient, it is easier to understand the patient's delusional experience. For example, patient, you people are all alike, all in uh, with the FBI plot to destroy me. Nurse, I don't want to hurt you, Tom. Thinking that people are out to destroy you must be very frightening. In this example, the nurse acknowledges the patient's experience, conveys empathy about the patient's fearfulness, avoids focusing on the content of the delusion, FBI, and plot to destroy, but labels the patient's feelings so they can be explored as tolerated. Note that talking about the feelings is helpful, but extended focus on delusional material is not. Box 15.3 Guidelines for Communication with Patients Experiencing Hallucinations Ask the patient directly about the hallucinations. Example, are you hearing voices? Followed by, what are you hearing? Watch the patient for cues that he or she is hallucinating, such as eyes darting to one side, muttering, appearing distracted, or watching a vacant area of the room. Avoid reacting to hallucinations as if they are real. Do not argue back to the voices. Do not negate the patient's experience, but offer your own perceptions. Example, I don't see the devil standing over you, but I understand how upsetting that must be for you. Focus on reality-based. Here and now, diversions such as conversations or simple pr projects. Tell the patient, the voice you, you hear is part of your illness. It cannot hurt you. Try to listen to me and the others you can see around you. Be alert and, and to signs of anxiety in the patient, which may indicate that hallucina hallucinations are increasing. It is never useful to debate or attempt to dissuade the patient regarding the delusion. Doing so can intensify the patient's retention of irrational beliefs and cause the patient to view you as rejecting or oppositional. However, it is helpful to clarify misinterpretations of the environment and gently suggest, as tolerated, a more reality-based perspective. For example, patient, I see the doctor is here. He is out to destroy me. Nurse, it is true the doctor wants to see you, but he wants to talk to you about your treatment. Would you feel more comfortable talking to him in the day room? Focusing on specific reality-based activities and events in the environment helps to minimize the focus on delusional thoughts. The more time the patient spends engaged in activities or with people, the more opportunities there are to receive feedback about and become comfortable with reality. Box 15, Guidelines for Communication with Patients ex Experiencing Delusions. To build trust, be open, honest, and reliable. Respond to suspicions in a matter-of-fact, empath empathic, supported, uh, supportive, and calm manner. Ask the patient to describe the delusions. Example, tell me more about someone trying to hurt you. Avoid debating the delusional content, but interject doubt where appropriate. Example, seems like it would be hard for that petite girl to hurt you. Focus on the feelings that underlie or flow from the delusions. Example, you seem to wish you could be more powerful, or it must feel frightening to think others want to hurt you. Once it is understood and addressed, do not dwell further on the delusion. Instead, focus on more reality-based topics. If the patient obsesses about delusions, set firm limits on the amount of time you will talk about them and explain your reason. 
Observe for events that trigger delusions. If possible, help the patient find ways to reduce or manage them. Validate if part of the delusion is real. Example, yes, there was a man at the nurse's station, but did not hear him talk about you. Work with the patient to find out which coping strategies succeed and how the patient can make the best use of them. Box 15.4 lists techniques for communicating with patients experiencing delusions, and Box 15.5 presents patient and family teaching topics for coping with hallucinations and delusions. Associative looseness. Associative looseness often mirrors the patient's autistic thoughts and help and reflects poorly organized thinking. An increase in associative looseness often indicates that the patient is feeling increased anxiety or overwhelmed by internal or external stimuli. The patient's ramblings may also produce confusion and frustration in the nurse. The following guidelines are useful for intervention with a patient whose speech is confused and disorganized. Do not pretend you understand the patient's words or meaning when you don't. Tell the patient you are having difficulty understanding. Place the difficulty in understanding on yourself, not on the patient. Example, I'm having trouble following what you are saying. Not, you're not making any sense. Look for recurring topics and themes in the patient's communications and tie these to events and timelines. Example, you've mentioned trouble with your brother several times, usually after your family has visited. Tell me about your f brother and your visits with him. Summarize or paraphrase the patient's communications to role model more effective ways of making his point and to give the patient a chance to correct anything you may have misunderstood. Reduce stimuli in the vicinity and speak concisely, clearly, and concretely. Tell the patient what you do understand and reinforce clear communication and accurate expression of needs, feelings, and thoughts. This is box 15.5, patient and family teaching coping and with auditory hallucinations or delusions. Distraction, listening to music, reading aloud may help more. Hey, I'm doing that. Counting backwards from 100, watching television, interaction, looking at others. Do they seem to be hearing, fearing what you are? If not, ignore the voices, thoughts, talking with another person. Activity, walking, cleaning the house, having a relaxing bath, playing the guitar, singing, going to the gym, or any place you enjoy being where others will be present. Talking to yourself, telling the voices or thoughts to go away, telling yourself that the voices and thoughts are a symptom and not real, telling yourself that no matter what you hear, voices can be safely ignored. Social action, talking to a trusted friend or member of the family, calling a helpline or going to a drop-in center, visiting a favorite place or a comfortable public place. Physical action, taking extra medication when ordered, call your prescriber, going for a walk or doing other exercise, using breathing exercises and other relaxation methods. Health teaching and health promotion. <coughs> Education is an essential strategy and includes teaching the patient and family about the illness, including possible causes, medications, and medication side effects, coping strategies, what to expect, and prevention of relapse. Understanding these things helps the patient and family to recognize the impact of stress, enhances their understanding of the importance of treatment to a good outcome, encourages involvement in and support of therapeutic activities, and identifies resources for con consultation and ongoing support in dealing with the illness, including family members and any strategies aimed at reducing psychotic symptoms, reduces family anxiety and distress, and enables the family to reinforce staff's efforts. The family plays an important role in the stability of the patient. The patient who returns to a warm, concerned, and supportive environment is less likely to experience a relapse. An environment in which people are critical or, or their involvement in the patient's life is intrusive is associated with relapse and poorer outcomes. Lack of understanding of the disease and its symptoms can lead others to misinterpret the patient's apathy and lack of drive as laziness. 
fostering a hostile response by family members, caregivers, or community. Thus, public education about the symptoms of schizophrenia can reduce tensions in families as well as communities. The most effective education occurs over time and is available when the family is most receptive. Box 15.6 offers guidelines for patient and family teaching about schizophrenia. Box 15.6, patient and family teaching schizophrenia. 1. Learn all you can about the illness. Attend psychoeducational and support groups. Join the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. Contact the National Institute of Mental Health, NIM. Discover a relapse prevention plan. Know the early warning signs of relapse, e.g. avoiding others, trouble sleeping, troubling thoughts. Know whom to call, what to do, and where to go when early signs of relapse appear. Make a list and keep it with you. Relapse is part of the illness, not a sign of failure. Take advantage of all psychoeducational tools. Participate in family, group, and individual therapy. Learn new ways to act and coping skills to help handle family, work, and social stress. Get information from your nurse, case manager, doctor, and NAMI. Community, community mental health groups or a hospital. Have a plan on paper of what to do to cope with stressful times. Everyone needs a place to address their fears and losses and, and to learn new ways of coping. Four, adhere to treatment. People who adhere to treatment that works for them do the best in coping with the disorder. Engaging in struggles over adherence does not help, but trying adherence to but tying adherence to the patient's own goals does. Staying in treatment will help you keep your job and avoid trouble with the police, is what you should say. Share concerns about troubling side effects or concerns about sexual problems, weight gain, feeling funny with your nurse, case manager, doctor, or social worker. Most side effects can be helped. Keeping side effects a secret or stopping medication can prevent you from having the life you want. 5. Avoid alcohol and or drugs. They can act on the brain and cause a relapse. Keep in touch with supportive people. Seven, keep healthy, stay in balance. Taking care of one's diet, health, and hygiene helps prevent medical illnesses. Maintain a regular sleep pattern. Keep active hobbies, friends, groups, sports, jobs, special interests. Nurture yourself and practice stress reduction activities daily. Integrative therapy, yoga as an injunctive treatment for schizophrenia. Social and occupational functioning is a problem for people with schizophrenia. Studies indicate that yoga in conjunction with conventional medical treatment may improve symptoms of schizophrenia. Social and occupational functioning and quality of life. Yoga is based on an ancient Indian spiritual practice that has been reported to improve the connection between the mind, body, and spirit. And in a randomized control study by Duraswamy and colleagues, 2007, 61 patients with the diagnosis of schizophrenia participated in a study that compared the efficacy of physical exercise, stretching, anaerobic, and yoga. Participants were supervised as they performed one or the other and also practiced independently for one hour each day. After four months, both groups experienced symptom reduction but subjects who had practiced yoga had greater improvement in both negative symptoms of schizophrenia and psychological quality of life. Yeah. Mac Hytidal's uh, 2008 found that yoga, together with traditional medical treatment, improved not only quality of life, but also occupational and social functioning. Yeah. Another randomized control study, uh, Cos Chiono focused on 45 people with schizophrenia who were assigned to either a physical ex exercise group 
brisk walking and jogging, or a traditional yoga group for one hour to five times for one hour five times a week. Both groups function better in terms of symptoms of schizophrenia and social and occupational functioning, but people in the yoga group did better for overall quality of life measures. Yoga is a promising and adjunctive treatment for schizophrenia that provides participants with an essential experience of grounding, especially in distinguishing themselves from the outside world. It may be centering quality it may be the centering quality of the breath breathing work in particular that improves the inner relationship of mind, body, and spirit. Pharmacological interventions. Drugs used to treat psych psychotic disorders, antipsychotics, first became available in the 1950s. Before that time, the, the available medications provided only sedation, not treatment, but the disorder, it's, for the disorder itself. Until the 1960s, patients who had even one episode of schizophrenia usually spent months or years in state or private hospitals. Psychotic episodes resulted in great emotional and financial burdens to families and patients. The advent of antipsychotic drugs at last provided symptom control and allowed patients to be managed in the community. Two groups of antipsychotic drugs exist. Conventional antipsychotics, traditional dopamine and antagonists, D2 dopamine receptor antagonists, also known as typical or first generation antipsychotics, and atypical antipsychotics, serotonin dopamine antagonists, 5-HT2A receptor antagonists, also known as second generation antipsychotics. Never newer third generation drugs, aripiprazole, arip now available, and uh, bifaprunex, pending, give hope for enhanced effectiveness and side effect reduction. Other drugs, such as anticonvulsants and anti-Parkinsonian drugs, are used to augment antipsychotics for patients who do not respond fully. For example, D-serine, an amino acid that enhances NMDA activity, has been shown to increase the effectiveness of selected antipsychotics. All antipsychotics are effective for most exasperations of schizophrenia and for reduction of mitigation of relapse. The conventional antipsychotics affect primarily the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, e.g. the hallucinations, delusions, disordered thinking. The atypical antipsychotics can improve negative symptoms, e.g. a sociality, blunted effect, lack of mo motivation as well. Antipsychotic agents usually take effect two to six weeks after the regimen is started, only about 10% of patients with schizophrenia fail to respond to antipsychotic drug therapy. Such patients should not continue to take medication that holds only risk, no benefit for them. Atypical antipsychotics. Atypical antipsychotics first emerged in the early 1990s with clozapine or clozaril. Unfortunately, clozapine produces a granulose. Uh, a granulocytosis, which is a low white blood cell count, in 0.8% to 1% of those who take it, and also increases the risk of seizures. Clozapine <coughs> excuse me, produces dramatic improvement in some patients whose disorder had been resistant to the earlier antipsychotics. Due to the risk for a granulocytosis, however, patients taking clozapine must have weekly white blood cell counts for the first six months then frequent monitoring uh, thereafter to obtain the medication. As a result, clozapine use is declining. Atypicals are often chosen as first-line antipsychotics because they treat both, both the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Furthermore, they produce minimal to no extrapyramidal side effects, EPSs, or tardive dyskinesia. Side effects tend to be significantly less and result in greater adherence to treatment. Atypical antipsychotics include risperidone, risperid risperidol, uh, olanzapine, Zyprexa, uh, which is Zyprexa, quetiapine, uh, or Seroquel, um, zipraz ziprazidone, or geodon, and aripazole or Abilify, which technically is a third generation drug. 
These atypicals are free of the potential hemat hematological side effects of clozapine and are all first-line agents because of their lower side effect profile. One significant disadvantage of the atypicals, with the exception of ziprazidone and aripiprazole, aripiprazole, that's a weird word, is that they have a tendency to cause significant weight gain. Metabolic syndrome, which includes weight gain, uh, dyslipidemia, and altered glucose metabolism, is a significant concern in most atypicals and increases the risk of of diabetes, hypertension, and atherosclerosis. So weight gain in all of them except aripiprazole and ziprazone are the atypicals. <sighs> Increase the risk of diabetes. Okay, uh, hypertension, atherosclerotic heart disease. Okay, an additional disadvantage of atypicals is that they are more expen expensive than Conventional antipsychotics, Table 15.7, lists the classification, route, and side effect profile of, anti of the antipsychotic drugs. Conventional antipsychotics. Conventional antipsychotics are antagonists at the D2 dopamine receptor site in both the limbic and motor centers. This blockage of D2 dopamine receptor sites in the motor areas causes extrapyramidal side effects, EPSs, which include Akathisia, akathisia, acute dystonias, pseudo Parkinsonism, and tardive dyskinesia. Other adverse reactions include anticholinergic effects, orthostasis, photosensitivity, and lowered seizure threshold. Table 15.7 Antipsychotic Drugs Classification root and side effect profile and I'm gonna let you read that because I'm not gonna read all that specific drugs are often chosen for their side effect profiles for example chlorpromazine or Thorazine is the most sedating agent and has fewer EPS's than do other antipsychotic agents but it causes significant hypotension haloperidol or haldol is less sedating and induces less hypotension but has a high incidence of EPSs. As a result, haloperidol has value for treating hallucinations because of its effectiveness in controlling positive symptoms with minimal hypotension and sedation. Patients may prefer less sedating drugs, but those who are agitated or excitable may do better with a more sedating medication. Conventional antipsychotics are becoming less common in the treatment of schizophrenia because of their minimal impact on negative symptoms and their side effects. However, conventional antipsychotics are effective against positive symptoms, are much less expensive than atypicals, and come in a depot, long-acting injectable form, which is given once or twice a month. Note, risperidone and a typical antipsychotic also available in a depot form. Okay, for patients who respond to them and can tolerate their side effects, conventional antipsychotics remain an appropriate choice, especially when metabolic syndrome or cost are concerns. The conventional antipsychotics are often divided into low potency and high potency drugs on the basis of their anticholinergic ACH side effects, EPSs, and sedative profiles. Low potency equals high sedation plus high acetylcholine effects plus low EPSs. High potency equals low sedation plus low acetylcholine effects plus high EPSs. Conventional antipsychotics are used cautiously in people with seizure disorders. They can lower the seizure threshold. Three of, or three of the more common EPSs are acute dystonia, acute sustained contraction of muscles, usually the head and neck, akathisia, psychomotor restlessness, evident as pacing or fidgeting, sometimes pronounced and very distressing to patients, and pseudo-Parkinsonism, a medication-induced temporary constellation of symptoms associated with Parkinson's disease, tremor, reduced 
accessory muscles, impaired gait, and stiffening of muscles. Most patients develop tolerance to them after a few months. EPSs can usually be minimized by lowering dosages and or adding anti-Parkinsonian drugs, uh, especially cent centrally acting anticholinergic drugs such as trihexaphenidyl and benztropin mesylate or cogentin, uh, diphenhydramine hydrochloride benadryl and amantadine hydrochloride semitrel are also useful are also useful the raspam a benzodiazepine may be helpful in reducing akathisia table 15.8 identifies some of the drugs most commonly used to treat EPSs unfortunately anti-parkinsonian drugs Parkinsonian drugs can cause significant anticholinergic side effects and worsen the antipsychotic and other anticholinergic and anti other anticholinergic medications. These side effects include urinary retention, dilated pupils, constipation, reduced visual accommodation, which is blurred vision, dry mucous membranes, reduced peristalsis, and cognitive impair impairment. Anticholinergic toxicity, a potentially life-threatening side effect usually seen in older adults or those on multiple antipsychotic drugs, produce hyperthermia, hot, dry, red skin, paralytic ileus, agitation, delirium, fluctuated, fluctuating vital signs, tachycardia, marked mydriasis, confusion, mental status changes, worsening of psychotic symptoms, and coma. 15a anti-parkinsonian and anticholinergic agents for treatment of uh, EPSs or extra pyramidal side effects note all anticholinergic agents ACAs can contribute to risk of anticholinergic toxicity practice caution when using multiple ACAs agents and i'm going to skip that actually Other troubling side effects of conventional antipsychotics include weight gain, sexual dysfunction, endoc endocrine disturbances, e.g. galacturia, drooling, and tardive dyskinesia, discussed in the following section. Weight gain, frequently a problem for women, can be more than 100 pounds. Therefore, changing the antipsychotic may be necessary. Impotence and sexual dysfunction are occasionally reported, but frequently experienced by men and may also necessitate a medication change. Table 15.9 identifies common side effects of the conventional antipsychotic medications, their usual times of onset, and related nursing and medical interventions. Tardive dyskinesia, TD or TDK, is a persistent EPS that usually appears after prolonged treatment and persists even after the medication has been discontinued. TDK consists of involuntary tonic muscular contractions that typically involve the tongue, fingers, toes, neck, trunk, or pelvis. This potentially serious EPS is most frequently seen in women and older patients and affects up to 50% of individuals receiving long-term high-dose therapy. TDK varies from mild to moderate and can be disfiguring or incapacitating. Common presentation is a guppy-like mouth movement, um, sometimes accompanied by tongue protrusion. Its appearance can contribute to stigmatization of mentally ill persons. Hmm, that sucks. Okay, table 15.9, side effects of conventional antipsychotics and related nursing interventions. Dry mouth. Provide frequent sips of water, ice chips, sugarless candy gum, and if severe, provide zero lube, a saliva substitute. Urinary retention and hesitancy. Check voiding. Try a warm towel on abdomen and consider catheterization if no result. Constipation, usually short term. May use stool softener. Ensure adequate fluid intake, increase fiber intake, use dietary laxatives, e.g. prune juice, 
Blurred vision, usually abates in one to two weeks, may require use of reading or magnifying glasses. If intolerable, consider consult regarding um, change in medication. Photosensitivity, encourage patient to wear sunglasses, sunscreen, sunblock and clothing, dry or limit exposure to sunlight, dry eyes, uh, use artificial tears. <laughs> Excuse me. Inhibition of ejaculation or impotence in men. Consult prescriber. Patient may need alternative medication. Anticholinergic toxicity. Dry mucous membrane. Reduced or absent peristalsis. Mydriasis. Uh, um, Non-reactive pupils. Hot, dry, red skin. Um, hyperpyrexia without diaphoresis, um, tachycardia, uh, agitation, unstable vital signs, worsening of psychotic symptoms, delirium, urinary retention, seizure, repetitive motor movements, and uh, the and those are all anticholergic toxicity symptoms, potentially life-threatening medical emergency, consult prescribe immediately, hold all medications, implement emergency cooling measures as ordered, cooling blanket, alcohol, or ice bath. Uh, implement urinary catheterization PRN uh, administer benzodiazepines or other PRN sedation as ordered uh, physostigamine may be ordered pseudoparkinsonianism uh, signs and symptoms mask like facies stiff and stooped posture shuffling gait, drooling, tremor, pill rolling phenomena onset 5 hours to 30 days um, that would be uh, in, administer PRN anti-Parkinsonian agent, e.g. trihexphenidyl, 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 or benztropin. If intolerable, consult prescriber regarding medication change. Provide towel or handkerchief to wipe excess saliva. Uh, acute dystonic reactions, signs and symptoms, acute contractions of tongue, face, neck, and back, uh, usually tongue and jaw first. When I administer anti-Parkinsonian agent as above, also consider uh, diphenhydramine, hydrochloride, or Benadryl, 25 to 50 milligrams IM or IV. Um, Opisthotonus is tit uh, titanic, heightening of entire body, head and belly up, oculogyric crisis, eyes locked upward, laryngeal dystonia could threaten airway, but it's rare. Onset in one to five days. Uh, some more interventions. Um, to prevent further dystonias with anti-Parkinsonian agents. Oh, uh, no. Uh, let's see. Experience can be frightening and patient may fear choking. Company to quiet area to provide comfort and support. Assist patient to understand the event and avert distortion or mistrust of medications. Uh, monitor airway. Okay. Akathisia, motor inner driven restlessness. E.g. tapping foot incessantly, rack, rocking forward and, and backward in chair, shifting weight from side to side. Um, consult prescriber regarding possible changes to medication. I give anti-Parkinsonian agent. Tolerance to akathasia does not develop, but akathasia disappears when neuroleptic is discontinued. Propan propanolol or endirol. Lorazepam, Ativan, or Diazepam Valium may be used in severe cases, may cause great distress and contribute to suicidality. Tardive dyskinesia, or D TDK, no, new, no known treatment. Face protruding and rolling tongue, blowing, smacking, licking, spastic facial distortion, smacking movements. Ooh, seen that. Discussing the drug rarely relieves symptoms. Possibly 20% of patients taking these drugs for more than two years may develop TDK. Nurses and doctors should encourage patients 
to be screened for TDK at, la at least three every three months. Uh, wow. The lens in TDK. Choeric, co choreic, choreic, rapid, purposeless, and irregular movements. Athetoid. Uh, athetoid means slow, complex, and serpentine movements. The trunk uh, of the body, neck and shoulder movements, dramatic hip jerks and rocking, twisting pelvic thrusts, onset months to years. Onset may merit consideration of meds. Uh, changes in appearance may contribute to stigmatizing response. Teach patient actions to conceal involuntary movements. Uh, purposeful muscle contraction overrides involuntary tardive movements. Check blood pressure before giving agent. A systolic pressure of 80 mmHg when standing is indication not to give the current dose. Advise patient to arise slowly to prevent dizziness and hold on to railings furniture while arising to reduce falls. Effect, uh, effect usually subsides when drug is stabilized in one to two weeks. Elastic bandages may prevent pulling. If condition is dangerous, consult prescriber regarding uh, medication change, volume expanders, or pressure agents. Tachycardia. Always evaluate patients with existing cardiac problems before antipsychotic drugs are administered. Haloperidol. Haldol is usually the preferred drug because of its low ACH effects. A granulocytosis, a potentially dangerous blood dysgracia. <coughs> Symptoms include sore throat, fever, malaise, and mouth sores. <clears throat> it is a rare occurrence, but a possibility the nurse should be aware of. Any flu-like symptoms should be carefully evaluated. Onset during the first 12 weeks of therapy occurs suddenly. Interventions would be blood work, usually done every week for six months, then every two months. Physician may order blood work to determine presence of leukopenia or granulocytosis. If test results are positive, the drug is discontinued and reverse isolation may be initiated. Mortality is high if the drug is not ceased and if treatment is not initiated. Teach patient to observe for signs of infection. Cholestatic jaundice, rare, reversible, and usually benign if caught in time. Prodromal symptoms are fever, malaise, nausea, and abdominal, abdominal pain. Jaundice appears one week later. Consult prescriber regarding possible medications. Bed rest and high-protein, high-carbohydrate diet if ordered. Liver function tests should be performed every six months. <coughs> Excuse me. Neuro, <clears throat> neuroleptic malignant syndrome, <clears throat> or NMS. It's rare, potentially fatal, <clears throat> acute, life-threatening medical emergency. Stop neuroleptic drug. Um, has severe extrapyramidal uh, muscle rigidity, oculogyric crisis, um, dysphagia. Flexor, it's denser, pox string, cog wheeling, whatever that is. Um, transfer stat to medical unit, promocryptine or parlodol, 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 how about that, parlodol, can relieve muscle rigidity and reduce fever. Hyperpyrexia. Elevated temperature over 103 or 39. Dantrolene or dantrium may reduce muscle spasms. Okay. Autonomic dysfunction, hypertension, tachycardia, di diaphoresis, incontinence. Uh, cool body to reduce fever. Cooling blankets, alcohol, water, cool water, or ice bath is ordered or as ordered. Delirium stupor coma. Maintain hydration with oral and IV fluids. Correct electrolyte imbalance. 
onset variable progresses rapidly to three days. Risk factors, concomitant use of psychotropics, uh, older age female, pres presence of mood disorder, and rapid dose titration. Uh, you would the titration you would increase. Small doses of heparin may decrease the possibility of pulmonary emboli. Early detection increases patient's chance of survival. Arrhythmias should be treated. Maintain hydration within oral and IV fluids. Correct electrolyte imbalance. Okay, back to tardive dyskinesia. Early symptoms of tardive dyskinesia are fasciculations of the tongue, described as looking like a bag of worms. Or, just, or constant smacking of the lips. These can progress into uncontrollable biting, chewing, or sucking motions. And open mouth and lateral movements of the jaw. No reliable treatment exists for tardive dyskinesia. The National Institute of Mental Health, NIM, developed the Abnormal Involuntary Movement Scale, a brief test for detection of tardive dyskinesia and other in involuntary movements, figure 15.3. It examines facial, oral, extremity, and trunk movements. Regular administration of the AIMS exam to detect TDK as early as possible is a key nursing role. Potentially dangerous responses to antipsychotics. Nurses need to know about some rare but serious and potentially fatal effects of antipsychotic drugs, including neuroleptic malignant syndrome, agranulocytosis, and liver impairment. Neuroleptic malignant syndrome, NMS, occurs in about 0.2 to 1% of patients who have taken conventional antipsychotics. It can occur with atypicals as well. Acute reduction in brain dopamine activity plays a role in its development. NMS is a life-threatening medical emergency and is fatal in about 10% of cases. It usually occurs early in therapy but has been reported in people after 20 years of treatment. NMS is characterized by reduced consciousness, increased muscle tone, muscular rigidity, and autonomic dysfunction, uh, including hyperplex pyrexia, labial hypertension, uh, tachycardia, tachnip tachnipia, or tachypnea, uh, diaphoresis, and drooling. Treatment consists of early detection, discontinuation of antipsychotics, um, management of fluid balance, <laughs> temperature reduction and monitoring for complications. Mild cases of neurolep neuroleptic malignant syndrome are treated with bromocryptine or barlodel. More severe cases are treated with intravenous dantrolene or dantrium. And even with electroconvulsive therapy, ECT, in some cases. A granulocytosis is a serious side effect and can be fatal. Liver impairment may also occur. Nurses need to be aware of the prodromal signs and symptoms of these side effects and teach them to their patients and patients' families. Table 15.9. Adjuncts to antipsychotic drug therapy. Antidepressants are recommended along with antipsychotic agents for the treatment of depression, which is common in schizophrenia. Refer to Chapter 13 for a more detailed discussion of depression and antidepressant drugs. Anti-manic mood-stabilizing agents have been helpful in, in enhancing the effectiveness of antipsychotics. Valproate is used during acute exasperations of psychosis to hasten response to antipsychotics. Lamotrigine may be given along with clozapine to improve therapeutic effects. Augmentation with benzodiazepines, e.g. clonazepam, clon, 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 can reduce excuse me can reduce anxiety and agitation and contribute to improved improvement in positive and negative symptoms. <coughs> When to change an antipsychotic regimen? 
The following circumstances suggest a need to adjust or change the antipsychotic agent or add supplemental medications, e.g. lithium, carbamazepine, or valproate. Inadequate improvement in target symptoms despite an adequate trial of drug. Persistence of dangerous or intolerable side effects. Specific interventions for paranoid, catatonic, and disorganized schizophrenia. The DSM criteria for the subtypes of schizophrenia are presented in figure 15.4 on page 334. The following se sections discuss the paranoid, catatonic, excited and withdrawn phases, and disorganized subtypes and identifies pertinent communication guidelines, self-care needs, and milieu needs. Paranoia. Any instance and strongly defended rational suspicion can be regarded as paranoia. Paranoia is evident at least intermittently in many people without psychotic disorders, but is verified as rational and discarded by the reality testing process. This process fails in, in the patients experiencing paranoia concomitant with psychotic disorders. For them, paranoid ideas cannot be corrected by experience or modified by facts or reality. Projection is the most common defense mechanism used in paranoia. When individuals with paranoia feel angry or self-critical, they project the feeling onto others and believe others are angry with or harshly critical toward them as if to s as if to say I'm not angry you are okay. paranoid schizophrenia usually lasts or usually has later age of onset late 20s to 30s develops rapidly in individuals with good morbid functioning tends to be intermittent 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 the first five years of the illness, and in some cases is associated with a good outcome or complete recovery. People with a paranoid disorder are usually frightened and may behave defensively, e.g. a delusion that another person is planning to kill the patient can result in the patient attacking or killing that person first. Paranoia is often a defense against painful feelings of loneliness, despair, helplessness and fear of abandonment. Useful nursing strategies are outlined in the following sections. That's figure 15.3 and that is way too small for me to read. So, on to communication guidelines. <coughs> because persons with paranoia have difficulty trusting those around them, they are usually guarded, tense, and reserved. To ensure interpersonal distance, they may adopt a superior, aloof, hostile, or sarcastic attitude, disparaging and dwelling on the shortcomings of others to maintain their self-esteem. Although they may <coughs> excuse me, shun interpersonal contact, functional impairment other than paranoia may be minimal. Patients frequently misinterpret the intent or actions of others, perceiving oversights as personal rejection. They also may personalize unrelated events ideas of reference or referentiality. For example, a patient might see a nurse talking to the psychiatrist and believe they are talking about him. During care, a patient su suffering from paranoia may make offensive yet accurate criticisms of staff and of unit policies. It is important that responses focus on reducing the patient's anxiety and fear and not be defensive reactions or rejections of the patient. Staff conferences and clinical supervision may maintain or help maintain objectivity and therapeutic perspective about the patient's motivation and behavior, increasing professional effectiveness. Self care needs. People with paranoid schizophrenia usually have stronger ego resources than do individuals with other schizophrenic disorders. This is particularly evident in occupational functioning and capacity for independent living. Grooming, dress, and self-care may not be problems and may, in fact, be meticulous. And in fact, be meticulous. Nutrition, however, may be affected by a delusion that the food is poisoned. Providing foods in commercially sealed packaging, or, for example, peanut butter and crackers, or nutritional drinks in cartons, can improve nutrition. If patients worry 
that others will harm them when they are asleep, they may be fearful of going to sleep, a problem that impairs restorative rest and warrants nursing intervention. Milieu needs. A person with paranoia may become physically aggressive in response to their paranoid hallucinations or delusions. The patient protects hostile dr drives into others and then acts on these drives. Homosexual urges are projected onto others as well, and fear of sexual advances from others may stimulate aggressions. A, an environment that provides a sense of security and safety minimizes anxiety and environmental distortions. Activities that distract the patient from ruminating on paranoid themes also decrease anxiety. Case study in nursing care plan 15.1 on pages 338 through 340 discusses a patient with paranoid schizophrenia. Catatonia, withdrawn phase. The essential feature of catatonia is abnormal levels of motor behavior, either extreme motor agitation or extreme motor retardation. Other associative behaviors include posturing, waxy flexibility, stereotyped behavior, muteness, extreme negativism, or automatic obedience, echolalia, and echopraxia, discussed earlier. Figure 15.4, diagnostic criteria for schizophrenic subtypes. And that... Basically says, schizophrenic disorders, paranoid, dominant hallucinations, delusions, no disorganized speech, disorganized behavior, catatonia, or inappropriate affect present. Uh, disorganized schizophrenic disorder would be dominant disorganized speech and disorganized behaviors and inappropriate affect uh, delusions and hallucinations if present are not prominent or fragmented and also associated features include grimacing mannerisms and other oddities of behavior catatonic schizophrenic disorder would be motor immobility f waxy flexibility or stupor um, excessive purposeless motor activity agitation extreme negativism or um, mutism, 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 mute, um, peculiar involuntary, voluntary movement, posturing, stereotyped movements, prominent mannerisms, prominent grimaces, uh, echolalia or echopraxia. Residual schizophrenic disorder. No longer has active phase symptoms, e.g. delusions, hallucinations, or disorganized speech and behaviors. However, persistence of some symptoms is noted, e.g. marked social isolation or withdrawal, marked impairment in role function, wage or nurse student or homemaker, markedly eccentric behavior or odd be beliefs, marked impairment in personal hygiene, marked lack of initiative, interest, or energy, and blunted or inappropriate affect. Undifferentiated schizophrenia has active phase symptoms, does have hallucinations, delusions, and bizarre behaviors. Uh, no one clinical presentation dominates, e.g. paranoid, disorganized, catatonic. So that's undifferentiated. So, uh, the onset of catatonia is usually abrupt and the prognosis favorable. With pharmacotherapy and improved individual management, severe catatonic symptoms are rarely seen today. Useful nursing strategies for intervening in catatonia are discussed in the following sections. Communication guidelines. Patients with catatonia can be so withdrawn they appear stuporous or comatose. They can be mute and re may remain so for hours, days, or even weeks or months if untreated. Although such patients may not appear to pay attention to events going on around them, they are acutely aware of the environment and may accurately remember events at a later date. Developing skill and confidence in working with withdrawn patients takes practice. The patient's inability or refusal to cooperate or participate in activities challenges staff to work to remain objective and avert frustration and anger. Self-care needs. In extreme withdrawal, a patient may need to be hand or tube fed to maintain adequate nutritional status. Aspiration is a risk. 
Normal control of bladder and bowel functions may be interrupted, so the assessment and management of urinary or bowel retention or incontinence is essential. When physical movements are minimal, are minimal or absent, range of motion exercises can reduce muscular atrophy, calcium depletion, and contractures. Uh, dressing and grooming usually require direct assistance. Milieu needs. The catatonic person's appearance may range from decreased spontan spontaneous movement to complete stupor. Waxy flexibility is often seen. For example, if the patient raises his arms over his head, he may maintain that position for hours or longer. Caution is advised because even after holding a single posture for long periods, the patient may suddenly and without provocation show brief outbursts of gross motor activity in response to inner hallucinations, delusions, and change in neurotransmitter levels. Catatonia, excited phase, communication guidelines. During the excited stage of catatonia, the person is in a stage of greatly increased motor activity. They may talk or shout continually and incoherently, requ requiring the nurse's communication to be clear, direct, and loud, enough to focus the patient's attention on the nurse, and to reflect concern for the safety of the patient and others. Self-care needs. A person who is constantly and intensely hyperactive can become completely exhausted and even die if medical attention is not available. Patients with concurrent medical conditions, e.g. congestive heart failure, are most at risk. Intramuscular administration of a sedative, antipsychotic, sedating antipsychotic is often required to reduce psychomotor agitation to a safer level. During heightened physical activity, the patient requires stimulation, reduction in additional fluids, calories, and rest. It is not unusual for the agitated patient to be destructive or aggressive to others in response to hallucinations or delusions or inner distress. Many of the concerns and interventions are the same as those for mania. Disorganized schizophrenia. Disorganized schizophrenia re represents the most regressed and socially impaired of all the subtypes. A person with disorganized schizophrenia may have marked associative looseness, a grossly inappropriate affect, bizarre mannerisms, and incoherence of speech and may display extreme social withdrawal. Delusions and hallucinations are fragmentary and poorly organized. Behavior may be considered odd, and a giggling or grimacing response to internal stimuli is common. Disorganized schizophrenia has an earlier age of onset, early to middle teens, often develops insidiously, is associated with poor premorbid functioning and a significant family history of psychiatric disorders, and carries a poor prognosis. Often these patients reside in state hospitals and can live safely in the community only in a structured, well-supervised setting. Families of patients living at home need significant community support, respite care, and access to day hospital services. Unfortunately, a good portion of these patients become homeless. See the case study and nursing care plan for disorganized thinking on the Evolve website. Communication guidelines. People with the disorganized schizophrenia experience persistent and severe perceptual and communication problems. Communication should be concise, clear, and concrete. Tasks should be broken into discrete tasks that are taken one at a time. Repeated refocusing may be needed to keep the patient on topic or to allow task completion. This repetition can be frustrating to the nurse and others, requiring special effort to identify and correct countertransference and non-therapeutic responses. Self-care needs. In patients with disorganized schizophrenia, grooming is neglected, hair is often dirty and matted, and clothes are unclean and often inappropriate for the weather, presenting a risk to self. Cognition, memory, and executive function are grossly impaired, and the patient is frequently too disorganized to carry out simple activities of daily living. Areas of nursing focus include encouraging optimal levels of functioning, preventing further regression, and offering alternatives for inappropriate behaviors whenever possible. Significant direct assistance for ADLs is needed. Milieu needs. Patients with disorganized schizophrenia need assistance to confirm their behavior to social expectations. To conform their behavior to social expectations. Nurses, nurses should provide for the patient's privacy needs. Peer education about the disorder may reduce peer frustration and acting out. Vignette. Martin Taylor, a 36-year-old man, is accompanied to the mental health center by his mother, Mrs. Lamb. Martin's nurse ob obtains background information from his mother. According to her, he had been in a state hospital for treatment of schizophrenia for three months, and after his discharge, was doing well at home until recently. His only employment history was five months as a junior 
as a janitor after high school graduation. His mother states that as a teenager, Martin was an excellent athlete and received average grades. At age 17, he had his first psychotic break when he took various street drugs. His behavior became markedly bizarre, e.g. eating cat food and swallowing a rubber sole heel, which precipitated an emergency lepar laparotomy. laparotomy. As, as Mrs. Lamb meets with Martin, he is unshaven and disheveled. He is wearing a headband that holds popsicle sticks and paper scraps. He chain smokes, paces, and frequently changes position. He reports that he is Alice from Alice in, in the Underground, and that people from space hurt him with needles. His speech is marked, but marked by associative looseness and occasional blocking, and he often stops in the middle of a phrase and giggles to himself. <laughs> he starts to giggle, and Mrs. Lamb asks what he is thinking about. He states, You interrupted me! He then begins to shake his head while repeating in a sing-song voice, Shake them tigers! Shake them tigers! He denies suicidal or homicidal ideation. Mrs. Lamb notes that Martin has great difficulty accurately perceiving what is going on around him. He exhibits regressed social behaviors, e.g. eating with his hands and picking his nose in public. He has no apparent insight into his problems, telling Mrs. Lamb that his biggest problem is the people in space. Undifferentiated Schizophrenia In the undifferentiated type, the schizophrenia active signs of, of the disorder, positive and or negative symptoms, are present, but the individual does not meet the criteria for any of the other subtypes. <coughs> <coughs> As with disorganized schizophrenia, undifferentiated uh, schizophrenia begins early, early to mid-teens, and has an insidious onset. However, the pre-morbid state is less predictable, and the disability remains fairly stable and per persistent over time. Residual schizophrenia in the residual type of schizophrenia, active phase symptoms are no longer present, but evidence of two or more residual symptoms persists. Residual symptoms typically include reduced initiative, interests, or energy, social withdrawal, impaired role function as employee, student, homemaker, speech deficits, e.g. circumstantiality, vague speech, and poverty of speech or content of speech, odd beliefs, magic, magical thinking, and unusual perceptual experiences. What's wrong with that? Nursing care for undifferentiated and residual schizophrenia is similar to that for withdrawn, paranoid, and disorganized schizophrenia as dictated by the patient's behavior. <coughs> Advanced practice interventions. Services that may in most locations be provided by advanced practice registered nurses, APRNs, include psych psychotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, um, group therapy, medication administration, social skills training, cognitive remediation, and family therapy. Family therapy is one of the most important interventions the APRN can implement, implement for the patient with schizophrenia. Family therapy. Family therapy is a service usually delivered by APRNs or other independently licensed personnel. Families of persons with schizophrenia often endure considerable hardships while coping with the psychotic and residual symptoms of the illness, particularly if they are direct caregivers. The patient and family may become isolated from other relatives, communities, and support systems. In fact, until the 1970s, and sometimes even today, families were often blamed for causing schizophrenia in the affected family member. NAMI and the National Alliance for Research in Schizophrenia and Depression NARS, NARSD, are actively involved in counter countering this image and in making families full partners in the treatment process. Family education and family therapy improve the quality of life for the patient with schizophrenia and reduce the relapse re rates for many patients. The following example shows how a family came to distinguish many Mar Martha's problems and the problem caused by schizophrenia came to distinguish between Martha's problems and the problem caused by schizophrenia. It was a good idea, a all meeting in our own home to discuss my sister's illness. We were all able to say how it felt, and for the first time, I realized that I knew very little about what she was suffering or how much. The word schizophrenia meant 
nothing to me before. I used to think she was just being lazy until she told me what it was really like. Programs that provide support, education, coping skills, training, and social network development are extremely effective. This psychoeducational approach brings educational and behavioral approaches into family treatment and does not blame families, but rather recognizes them as secondary victims of a biological illness. In family therapy sessions, fears, faculty, or faulty communication patterns, and distortions are identified. Problem-solving skills are taught. Healthier alternatives to conflicts are explored, and guilt and anxiety can be lessened. Evidence-based practice: cognitive interventions for auditory hallucinations problem. Medications alone do not always fully relieve hallucinations. Research has suggested that cognitive interventions can reduce distress stemming from residual hallucinations. Purpose of study. This study sought to determine whether structured cognitive nursing interventions could produce significant improvement in populations of patients who hear voices. Methods. A sample of patients was divided into a usual care control group and an experimental structured cognitive intervention group. Symptom reports, treatment adherence, and other parameters were measured pre- and post-intervention. A clinical nurse specialist provided 12 90-minute individual cognitive less sessions focusing on patients' thoughts about their hallucinations and alternate, alternate ways of thinking about their hallucinations that would be more reality-based and less distressing. Key findings, the cognitive intervention group demonstrated significant improvement <sighs> In self-esteem and sub subject distress related to symptoms. This outcome is consistent with research showing that hearing voices is tied to poor self-esteem and the nature of one's relationship with the voices. So this outcome is consistent with research showing that hearing voices is tied to poor self-esteem. Interesting. Implications of nursing practice. Existing cognitive interventions, when added to traditional psychopharmacology, pharmacology, can significantly enhance symptom management. Although within the scope of practice for nurses, such interventions are not consistently used as at present. Training nurses in their, use in, in their use and providing other support to increase their use has the potential to contribute to a higher quality of life for persons with residual hallucinations. Evaluation. Evaluation is especially important in planning care for people who have psychotic disorders. Outcome expectations that are unrealistic discourage patient and staff alike. It is critical for staff to remember that change is a process that occurs over time. For a person with schizophrenia, progress may occur erratically and gains may be difficult to discern in the short term. It is important to reassess chronically ill patients regu regularly so that new data can be considered and treatment adjusted when needed. Questions to be asked include, is the patient not progressing because a more important need is not being met? Is the staff making the best use of the patient's strengths and interests to promote treatment and achieve desired outcomes? Are other possible interventions being overlooked? Are new or better interventions available? How is the patient responding to existing or recently changed medication or other treatments? Is the patient becoming discouraged, anxious, or depressed? Is the patient treatment adherent? Are side effects controlled or troubling? Is functioning improving or regressing? What is the patient's quality of life? Is it improving? Is the family involved, supportive, or knowledgeable regarding the patient's disorder and treatment? Active staff involvement an interest in the patient's progress communicates concern and caring, helps the patient to maximize progress, promotes treatment adherence, and reduces staff feelings of helplessness and burnout. Input from the patient can offer valuable information about why a certain desired outcome has not occurred. Case Study and Nursing Care Plan Paranoid Schizophrenia <coughs> Tom, a 32-year-old man, is an inpatient at a Veterans Administration Hospital. He has been separated from his wife and four children for three years. His records state that he has been in and out of hospitals for 13 years. Tom is a former Marine who first heard voices at the age of 19 while he was serving in the Gulf War. He subsequently received a medical discharge. The hospitalization was precipitated by an exasperation of auditory hallucinations. I thought people were following me. 
I hear voices, usually a woman's voice, and she's tormenting me. People say that it happens because I don't take my medications. The medications make me tired, and I can't have sex. Tom also used marijuana, which he knows increases his paranoia. It makes me feel good, and not much else does. Tom finished 11 years of school, but, not, but did not graduate. He says he has no close friends. He spent five years in prison for manslaughter and was abusing alcohol and drugs when the crime occurred. Drug abuse has also been a contributing factor to Tom's psychiatric hospitalizations. Miss Lally is Tom's nurse. Tom is dressed in pajamas and bathrobe. His hygiene is good, and he is well nourished. He reports that he does not sleep much because the voices get worse at night. Miss Lally notes in Tom's medical record that he has had two episodes of suicidal ideation, during which the voices were telling him to jump off, roof to off rooftops and in front of trains. During the first interview, Tom rarely makes eye contact and speaks in a low monotone. At times, he glances about the room as if distracted, mumbles to himself, and appears upset. Nurse. Tom, my name is Miss Lally. I will be your nurse in the hospital. If it is okay with you, we will meet every day for 30 minutes at 10 a.m. We can talk about areas of concern to you. Well, don't believe what they say about me. I want to start. Are you married? This time is for you to talk about your concerns. Oh, looks furti furtively around the room, then lowers his eyes. I think someone is trying to kill me. You seem to be focusing on something other than our conversation. <coughs> the voices tell me things. I can't say. Nurse, I don't hear any voices except yours and mine. I will stay with you. Tell me what is happening and I will try to help you. Tom, the voices tell me bad things. Miss Lally stays with Tom and encourages him to communicate with her. As Tom focuses more on the conversation, his anxiety appears to lessen. His thoughts become more connected. He is able to concentrate more, and he mumbles to himself less. Assessment. Self-assessment. On the first day of admission, Tom assaults another male patient, stating the patient accused him of being a homosexual and touched him on the buttocks. After assessing the incident, the staff agrees that Tom's provocation came more from his own projections, Tom's sexual attraction to the other patient, than from anything the other patient did or said. Tom's difficulty with impulse control frightens Miss Lally. She has concerns regarding Tom's ability to curb his impulses and the possibility of Tom striking out at her, especially when Tom is hallucinating and highly delusional. Miss Lally mentions her concerns to the nursing coordinator, who suggests that Miss Lally meet with Tom in the day room until he demonstrates more control and less suspicion of others. After five days, Tom is less excitable and the sessions are moved to a room set aside for patient interviews. Miss Lally also speaks with the senior staff nurse regarding her fears. By talking to the senior nurse and understanding more clearly her own fear, Mrs. Lally is able to manage her fear and identify interventions to help Tom regain a better sense of control. Objective data <coughs> Excuse me. speaks in low monotone, makes poor eye contact, Weight appropriate for height. Clean, bathed, clothes match. Impaired reality testing. Has a, a history of drug abuse, cocaine and marijuana, which appears to contribute to relapses. Has no friends. Separated from wife and children. Was first hop hospitalized at age 19. Has not worked since that time. Has had suicidal impulses twice, both associated with command hallucinations. Was imprisoned for five years for violence manslaughter and assaulted appear in, in the hospital thoughts scattered when anxious subjective data i hear voices someone is trying to kill me i think i don't take my medications they make me tired and i can't have sex the voices get worse at night and i can't sleep drugs make me feel good not much else does voices have told him to jump off rooftops and in front of trains diagnosis disturbed thought processes related to alteration in neurological function as evidenced by persecutory hallucina hallucinations and paranoia voices have told him to jump off rooftops and in front of trains someone is trying to kill me i think Pro abuses co abuses cocaine and marijuana although these increase paranoia 
because they make me feel good. Two, non-adherence to medic medication regimen related to side effects of therapy as evidenced by verbalization of non-compliance and persistence of symptoms. Failure to take prescribed medication because they make me tired and I can't have sex. Chronic history of relapse of symptoms. Outcomes identification. Tom consistently refrains from acting upon his voices and suspicions. Tom consistently adheres to treatment regimen. Planning. The nurse plans intervention that will, one, help deal, Tom deal with his disturbing thoughts, and two, minimize drug abuse and adverse effects of medication to increase adherence and decrease the potential for relapse and violence. Implementation. Nursing diagnosis disturbed thought processes related to schizophrenia as evidenced by patients saying voices are scaring me. <coughs> Outcome, Tom consistently refrains from acting upon his voices and suspicions when they occur. Short-term goal. 1. By the end of the first week, Tom will recognize the presence of hallucinations and identify one or more contributing factors as evidenced by telling his nurse when they occur and what preceded them. Intervention. Meet with Tom each day for 30 minutes to establish trust and rapport. Explore these times when voices are most threatening and disturbing, noting the circumstances that precede them. Pro provide non-competitive activities that focus on the here and now. Rationale. Short, consistent meetings help decrease anxiety and establish trust. Identifies events that increase anxiety and trigger voices by learning to manage triggers. Hallucinations can be reduced. Increased time spent in reality-based activities decreases focus on hallucinations. Evaluation goal met by the end of the first week. Tom tells the nurse when he is experiencing hallucinations. Goal 2. By the end of the first week, Tom will recognize hallucinations as not real and ascribe them to his illness. Interventions explore content of hallucinations with Tom. Educate Tom about the nature of hallucinations and ways to determine if voices are real. Rationale. Identify suicidal or aggressive themes or command hallucinations. Improves Tom's reality testing and helps him begin to attribute his experiences to schizophrenia. Okay. If the goal is met, then... Tom identifies that the voices tell him he is a loser and he needs to be careful because someone is after me. He identifies that the voices are worse at nighttime. He notes that others do not seem to hear what he, he hears and also states that smoking marijuana and taking cocaine produce very threatening voices. So, three. By discharge, Tom will consistently report a decrease in hallucinations. Intervention, explore with Tom possible actions that can minimize anxiety and or reduce hallucinations such as whistling or reading aloud. Um, this offers alternatives while anxiety level is relatively low. If the goal is met, Tom states that he is hearing li voices less and they are less threatening to him. Tom identifies that if he whistles or sings, he stays calm and can, and can c control his voices. Nursing diagnosis, non-adherence. Outcome, Tom consistently adheres to medication regimen. <coughs> Excuse me. Short-term goal, by the end of the week, one, Tom will discuss his concerns about medication with staff. Interventions, evaluate medication response and side effect issue, issues. Initiate medication change to olanzapine or Zyprexa. A large dose is taken at bedtime to increase sleep, and a small dose is taken during the day to, to decrease fatigue. Educate Tom regarding side effects, how long they last, and what actions can be taken. Rationale. Ident identify drugs and dosages that have increased therapeutic value and decreased side effects. Olanzapine causes no known sexual side effects. Uh, can give increased sense of control over symptoms. The goals met. Tom identifies the reasons for stopping his medications. He agrees to try olanzapine uh, because he trusts staff's assurance that the side effects will be reduced. Tom states that he sleeps better at, at night but is still tired during the day. 
two. By the end of the week two, Tom will describe two ways to reduce or cope with side effects and two ways the medication medications help him meet his goals, e.g. avoiding jail and reducing fear. Uh, interventions connect Tom with local NAMI support group. Um, this provides peer support on a and a chance to hear from others further along in recovery. How medications can be helpful and side effects can be managed. NAMI group can also offer suggestions for dealing with his loneliness and other problems. The goals met. Week 1, Tom attends meeting. Week 2, he speaks in the group about not feeling good. Several group members say they understand and try to help him figure out. Oh, one moment. Try to help him figure out why he's not feeling good. Peers say how taking medication has helped them feel better. Evaluation. By discharge, Tom expresses hope that the medicines will help him feel better and avoid problems like jail. He has a better understanding of his medications and what to do for side effects. He knows that marijuana and cocaine increase the symptoms and explains that when he gets lonely, he now has ideas of things other than drugs he can do to feel good. Tom continues with the support group and outpatient counseling, stating that it's because Miss Lally really cared about him. This made him want to go get better and led him to trust what staff told him. He reports sleeping much better and says that he has more energy during the day. Key points to remember. <laughs> Excuse me. Schizophrenia is a biological disorder of the brain. It is not one disorder, but a group of disorders with overlapping symptoms and treatments. The, the primary difference among subtypes involve the spectrum of symptoms that dominate, their severity, the impairment in affect and cognition, and the impact on social and other areas of functioning. Psychotic symptoms are often more pronounced and obvious than are symptoms found in other disorders, making schizophrenia more likely to be apparent to others and, and increasing the risk of stigmatization. Neurochemical catecholamines and serotonin genetic and neuroanatomical findings f help explain the symptoms of schizophrenia however no one theory accounts fully for the complexities of schizophrenia when the nurse works with patients with schizophrenia four categories of symptoms may be evident the positive and negative symptoms of schizophrenia are two of the major categories of symptoms symptoms vary considerably among patients and fluctuate over time Positive symptoms of schizophrenia, e.g. hallucinations, delusions, associative looseness, are more pronounced and respond best to antipsychotic drug therapy. The negative symptoms of schizophrenia, e.g. social withdrawal and, dis and dysfunction, lack of motivation, reduced affect, respond less well to antipsychotic therapy and tend to be more debilitating. The tr degree of cognitive impairment warrants careful assessment an active intervention to increase the patient's ability to adapt, function, and maximize the ultimate quality of life. Comorbid depression must be identified and treated to reduce the potential for suicide, substance abuse, non-adherence, and relapse. Some applicable nursing diagnoses include disturbed sensory perception, disturbed thought processes, impaired communication, ineffective coping, risk for self-directed or other directed violence, and impaired family coping. Outcomes are chosen based on the type and phase of schizophrenia and the patient's individual needs, strengths, and level of functioning. Short-term and intermediate indicators are also developed to better track the incremental progress typical of schizophrenia. Interventions for people with schizophrenia include trust building, therapeutic communication techniques, support, assistance with self-care, promotion of independence, stress management, promotion of socialization, psychoeducation to promote understanding and adaptation, milieu management, 
cognitive behavioral interventions, cognitive enhancement, remediation techniques, and medication administration. Because antipsychotic medications are essential in the care of patients with schizophrenia, the nurse must understand the properties, adverse and toxic effects, and dosages of con conventional and atypical antipsychotics and other medications used to treat schizophrenia. The nurse helps the patient and family understand and appreciate the importance of medication to recovery. Schizophrenia can produce countertransference responses in staff. Clinical supervision and self-assessment help the nurse remain objective and therapeutic. Okay, that was chapter 15, Schizophrenia of Var Corrales.